Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Special Edition. My name is Camel, but more excitingly, however, welcome back to the Elder Scrolls Detective Series, a series in which we investigate, curate, speculate, hypothesize, theorize, and quite often simply highlight and discuss interesting, mysterious, and hidden things that can be found within the Elder Scrolls games. Today, we will be donning a magical mantle and entering the College of Winterhold to investigate one of the most mysterious characters in the game. He who can be found buried deep beneath the arcane institution. I speak, of course, of an entity known as the Augur of Dunlane. If you have done the College of Winterhold's main questline, you will have run across this ethereal being. The Augur of Dunlane was once a man. Then, through unknown means, with unknown costs, became what we find here in game a non corporeal yet sentient orb of light, who, most notably, has the ability to see into the future. Now, while the Elder Scrolls universe is full of strange and wonderful magics, Farsight is not something to be dismissed as common magic. Examples of it within the games are incredibly rare, and when you do find them, they are incredibly vague too. Yet, here we have the Augur of Dunlane, who along with untold magical abilities and the gift of Farsight, also comes with almost absolutely no explanation. We meet a timeless, all-knowing being that gets brushed over in a matter of minutes. Sorry, Sigic Order. Forget the Eye of Magnus. I want to know more about this dude. Anyone else feel that same way? Well, today's your lucky day, because just like a good Friday night, we're going in deep. We'll delve thoroughly into the questions of who was the Augur of Dunlane in life, what happened to the Augur of Dunlane, and at what cost. AKA, did the Augur of Dunlane cause the Great Collapse of Winterhold? But most importantly of all, who on Nern, or in Oblivion, Mundus, or Aetherius, is the Augur of Dunlane as we find him here in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim? Is he alive? Is he a ghost? Maybe an illusion? A Daedra? A Demi Prince? A Hag Prince? Is he an aspect of an Aedra? Maybe one of the old Elnofei? Did he achieve Chim? Well, he's... well, let's find out. Just a quick heads up, be prepared to explore some deep areas of the lore and some places that you will not be expecting to go. Now, if this kind of stuff interests you, be sure to check out my other Elder Scrolls detective videos that I have already done. They can be found down in the description via the Elder Scrolls detective playlist link. Now, down there in the old description, you can also find all of my social media links. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, along with joining our brand new Discord server that I've made for our community, where we can further discuss what we're about to delve into. I look forward to seeing you there. And if you do wish to watch this video in intervals or experience a particular topic again, I have also provided timestamps in the description and in the comments. For now though, Buckle up with your most powerful belt of Fortify Magicka, because we're going to need it. So, when we set off on our Kabbalistic Odyssey, join the College of Winterhold and attend our first class, eager to learn about the occult arts, we'll soon be scurried off to an ancient Atmoran ruin called Sarthal. While we are in here, we will be visited by a Sigic monk called Nerian. Hold, mage, and listen well. Know that you have set in motion a chain of events that cannot be stopped. Judgment has not been passed, as you had no way of knowing. Judgment will be passed on your actions to come, and how you deal with the dangers ahead of you. This warning is passed to you because the Sigic Order believes in you. You, Mage, and you alone have the potential to prevent disaster. Take great care and know that the Order is watching. Now, we'll get onto the significance of the Sigic Order and their involvement much later on. For now though, on with the quest. Soon enough, we'll enter the tomb of Jirik Golderson, son of the Breton First Era Archmage Goldir. 
In here, we will find the Etardin artifact called the Eye of Magnus. This is a significant discovery for the Arcane University and all of Nern for that matter. It is swiftly transported to the College of Winterhold for further investigation and research, placed safely into the magical font of the College's magics. A few quests later, we'll be summoned to the Archmage's quarters, as a Sidging monk has arrived at the College, actually in person this time. Curiously, this isn't Nerian, the monk we spoke to in Sarthal. This is a different monk named Quarinir. Please do not be alarmed. I mean you no harm. It is good to meet you in person. What's going on? What uh, happened to everyone? I'd simply like to talk to you. I've given us a chance to speak privately. But I'm afraid I can't do this for long. We must be brief. The situation here at your college is of dire importance. And attempts to contact you, as we have previously, have failed. I believe it is due to the very source of our concern. This object, the Eye of Magnus, as your people have taken to calling it. The energy coming from it has prevented us from reaching you with the visions you have already seen. The longer it remains here, the more dangerous the situation becomes. And so I have come here personally to tell you it must be dealt with. If this is dangerous, then why don't you do something about it? I'm afraid it's not that simple. You must understand the Sigic Order does not typically intervene directly in events. My presence here will be seen as an affront to some within the Order. As soon as we have finished, I will be leaving your college. I'm all too aware that my arrival has aroused suspicion, especially in Onkano, your Thalmor associate. Nevertheless, my order will not act directly. You must take it upon yourself to do so. So what exactly is the problem? As you may have learned, this object, the Eye, is immensely powerful. The world is not ready for it. If it remains here, it will be misused. Indeed, many in the Order believe it has already. Rather, something will happen soon, something that cannot be avoided. What do you expect from me, then? We believe that your efforts should be directed towards dealing with the aftermath. But we cannot predict what that will be. I fear I have already overstepped the bounds of my Order. But I will offer this. Seek out the Augur of Dunlane here in your college. His perception may be more coherent than ours. Who is the Augur of Dunlane? He was once a student here at the college. Now he is... something different. Where can I find this Augur? I... I am unsure. He is somewhere within the college. Surely one of your colleagues must know his location. I am sorry I cannot provide you with further help. But this conversation requires a great deal of effort on my part. Now, I'm afraid I must leave you. We will continue to watch over you and guide you as best we can. It is within you to succeed. Never forget that. I'm sorry. Where were you about what to say something? What is the meaning of this? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't understand. Don't play coy. You asked to see a specific member of the college. Here he is. Now what is it that you want? There's been a misunderstanding. Clearly I should not be here. I shall simply take my leave. What? What trickery is this? You're not going anywhere until I find out what you're up to. I am not up to anything. I apologize if I have offended you in any way. We will see about this. Hmm. Very curious indeed. The Sigic Order, the most powerful and ancient faction of sorcerers, came here to the College of Winterhold to see us showing face on Nern for the first time in just over 100 years. And they specifically told us to seek out the Augur of Dunlane. This Augur must have some great significance, especially if the Sigic Order is directing us to him for magical assistance that not even they can provide. Well, we must investigate further and ask everyone we can about the Augur of Dunlane. Brelina, have you heard of the Augur of Dunlane? Huh? That sounds ominous. Are you getting yourself into even more trouble? No. Did you ask Mirabelle? She runs things around here after all. Ah, I'll see you tonight. Bring the Tilbani Bug Musk. 
Onmond, have you ever heard of the Augur of Dunlane? I've never heard of anything like that. Did you ask Tolfdir? He's been here a long time and seems to know almost everything. Almost everything? His catchphrase is, I have no idea. I have no idea. Jizago, have you ever heard of the Augur of Dunlane? The what of what? No, no idea. If it is important, maybe Tolfdir knows. He seems to know a lot. Hmm, meow. And Kano, you seem like a know-it-all. Have you ever heard of the Augur of Dunlane? The what? No, no, I'm quite sure I have no idea what you're talking about. I suggest you mind your own business and return to whatever it is you do here. Charming, as always. Arniel, you're going to zero sum soon. Better spill the beans while you can. Have you heard of the Augur of Dunlane? What? The Augur? Oh no, I'm quite sure that's... He's nothing I'm involved in. No, no. Mirabel Irvine or Tolfdir, they're qualified to discuss him. Not me. Definitely not. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Enthir, you sell Daedra hearts. You surely can tell me about the Augur of Dunlane. Oh, no, no. That won't do at all. Not my problem. Not even a little. Take it to Tolfdir. He's supposed to be looking after you lot. Really? Not even you can hook me up. Nyria, does the Augur of Dunlane ring any bells? It's not enough that you've stolen the spotlight with this eye thing. Now you're looking for the Augur. I'm not sure what you're playing at, but you do well to remember your place around here. By Periite, do you have PMS? Post-magical stress? Feralta, have you ever heard of the Augur of Dunlane? The Augur? Really? Well, it's certainly not my place to say anything about it. I think you'd better go see Mirabel Irvine. Ah, glad we got that sorted. Ah, bloody hell, it's like trying to get hist sap from a sigil stone. Let's go to the big boss. Archmage, you're here to impart knowledge. Have you ever heard of the Augur of Dunlane? Has Tolfdir been telling stories again? I thought I made it quite clear that this was a subject inappropriate for conversation. Please, don't allow him to continue to discuss the subject. Ugh, worst Archmage ever. Colette, you're nice. Have you ever heard of the Augur of Dunlane? The Augur? Mm, tragic story, really. At least, the way I heard it. But that was a long time ago. It was some experiment gone horribly wrong. Ghastly results, I was told. And his ghost still roams the halls, they say. Of course, on further reflection, that may have simply been an attempt to scare me. Hmm... Perhaps I'll ask Tolfdir what really happened. I understand he was here at the time. Huh, interesting. Now let's talk to the remaining two that the rest of the rabble have referenced us to in regards to the Augur of Dunlane. Mirabel, have you heard of the Augur of Dunlane? That's nothing you need to concern yourself with. Mirabel, I'm not asking. Tell me where the Augur is. Very well. It's not something often discussed, as it might be misunderstood by the locals. The Augur is down in the Midden, below the college. I don't recommend going down there unless it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. Tolf, dear, I've been led to you. Tell me about the Augur of Dunlane, please. Well now, there's a name I haven't heard in some time. My goodness, it's been years since I've spoken with him. I suppose he's still down in the Midden, but I haven't checked. Are you going to see him? Do tell him hello for me, won't you? Where is the Midden? Underneath the college. It's not the nicest place, so if you go down there, please do be careful. Can you tell me more about the Augur of Dunlane? Well, I suppose he wouldn't mind. It was all before my time, you understand. I've heard the stories, the same as anyone else. He was a brilliant student, an accomplished wizard delved into magic in a way none had seen before. But I think he became too focused on just how much power he could acquire. That's what led to the accident. What accident? Do you remember what I first told you? About how not being able to control magic could destroy you? I didn't simply mean it could kill you. The Augur's accident is another very real type of a life destroyed. Well, it's been described as an accident. I can't imagine it was intentional. Something must have gone wrong, and he ended up in the state he's in now, fused to the energies that flow through the college. I've never felt it appropriate to ask him about it, 
about how that must feel. Or I suppose, if he can feel at all. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. We'll get back to the implications of all of this dialogue in time. For now, we must delve into the Midden and the Midden Dark to find this Augur of Dunlane. The Midden is a grim, twisted, and still twisting nest of ice rock and stacked slabs, dripping and slippery, mossed and mazed. Obscure remnants linger in dark corners and lit hallways, occult memories of odd activities that took place here many moons ago. These finds are important, but we'll get back to that a little later on, as they reveal a great deal about our friend, the Augur of Dunlane. Soon we'll pass deeper into the Midden Dark, a colder and further sunken subterrain entombed in ancient ice. Here we will find what we seek. There is no help for you here. There is no solace in knowing what is to come. Your perseverance will only lead to disappointment. Still, you persist. Very well, you may enter. So you're the Augur of Dunlane. I am that which you have been seeking. Your efforts are in vain. It has already begun. But those who have sent you have not told you what they seek. What you seek. And what is it I'm seeking? You seek that which all who wield magic seek. Knowledge. You shall find this. Knowledge will corrupt, it will destroy, it will consume. You seek meaning, shelter in knowledge. You will not find it. The Thalmer sought the same thing, and it shall lead to his end, as it has so many others. I was told to find you. Indeed. And so you have come looking though you do not know why. Like others before you, you blindly follow a path to your own destruction. The Thalmor came seeking answers as well, unaware they will be his undoing. Your path now follows his, though you will arrive too late. Thalmor? What Thalmor? The one who calls himself Ancano. He seeks information about the Eye, but what he will find shall be quite different. His path will cross yours in time, but first you must find that which you need. I'm not the first to come see you. No. Though you may be the last, the one who calls himself Ancano has sought my knowledge as well, through very different questions. Your path differs from most. You are being guided, pushed towards something. It is a good path, one untraveled by many. It is a path that can save your college. I will tell you what you need to know to follow it further. What do I need? You, and those aiding you, wish to know more about the Eye of Magnus. You wish to avoid the disaster of which you are not yet aware. To see through Magnus's eye without being blinded, you require his staff. Events now spiral quickly towards the inevitable center. So you must act with haste. Take this knowledge to your Archmage. And then 
he simply vanishes. Now we do get to interact with the Augur of Dunlane on one other occasion. When our restoration skill reaches level 90, we can speak to Colette Marens about mastering the school of restoration. Colette, what else is there to be learned about restoration magic? Look at you, such a devoted student of restoration. It's comforting to see that not everyone has dismissed it as entirely as most members of the college. Truly comforting. It looks like you're ready to speak with the Augur. You were always going on about it. I thought you were the authority on this subject. Oh, goodness, no. There are those far more skilled than I. The Augur was a brilliant mage. Truly inspired. Mastered spells others could barely comprehend. He was especially gifted when it came to restoration. He's... well... He's very particular about who shares the knowledge. So you'll need his approval first. Go on, go talk to him. I'm sure he's been paying attention and will be expecting you. So down we go back into the midden dark to stand before the auger once again. Once again, you have come seeking something. The circumstances differ this time. I have what you seek. Are you prepared? I'm ready for anything, except doing my taxes. Arrogance will serve you poorly. Your worth must be determined before knowledge can be bestowed upon you. And so, you shall be tested. Colette has already told you. You must be tested before knowledge can be imparted to you. You will rely on your skill as a mage, not on your belongings, not on your scrolls and potions. Only what lies within. Survive, and you are worthy. This is the test put before you. Will you accept? What kind of test is this? Knowledge is power. Knowing spells can be powerful, but applying that knowledge is key. You will be called upon to rely solely on your restoration spells. I'm ready for your test. Step into the light, and your test begins. This conversation will conjure a magical sphere that we must enter, which will summon hostile ghosts that will attack us and that we must heal ourselves through. Upon doing so, we'll simply complete the quest, and we will never, and can never, interact with the Augur of Dunlane again, or bring him up as a subject to any NPC, so that is quite actually that. We cannot experience or learn about the Augur of Dunlane any further, as there is no more content in regards to him. But, as the length of this video has surely given away, there is plenty to unpack and deduce from what we have experienced. There are clues in every syllable and stone that we have passed. So, in broad strokes, in life, the Augur was a prolific student at the College of Winterhold, delving into magic in a way that none had seen before, mastering spells others could barely comprehend, and notably excelling in restoration magic. Then, supposedly, an obsession with gaining power led to what is assumed to be an accident, which transformed him into what we find in modern-day Skyrim, a non-corporeal entity that takes the form of a large ball of light. I mean, at face value, it's very strange. And as we're going to discover, beyond face value, it's very, very strange. So firstly, who was the Augur of Dunlane before this, and I quote, accident? Well, the first clues to the answer to this question actually lie within the Midden and the Midden Dark. As we know, the Midden is a grim dungeon that mantles almost all definitions of occult. 
there are remnants of strange rituals, beasts and skeletons and mythical creatures skulk through the frigid darkness. Olden corpses scattered through hallways, oddities litter corners and queer effigies, fetishes and totems decorate the dungeon. All of which summon an uneasiness among visiting patrons and amp up a heightened state of awareness. But the midden and its furnishings rub us in such a way because they are actually familiar. If we look at the human skeleton with an animal head or the strange bone sculptures that form terrifying sigils, they are suspiciously reminiscent, if not entirely mimicking, the same effigies that we can find within Forsworn camps. Yes, that's right, the barbaric Reachman tribes that inhabit northeastern High Rock and western Skyrim throughout the Druadic Mountains. Why would their cultural customs be present in something like the Midden, which is on the opposite end of Skyrim and also found beneath an eons old, structured and especially when compared to Reachman tribes in their culture, much more gentrified institution for magic, the College of Winterhold. It seems rather weird, right? Well, the answer's quite interesting. The Augur of Dunlane. What does that mean? The Augur of Dunlane. Hmm. Well, the word Augur is a real word that means to foretell, especially by way of omens, to foreshadow, to prognosticate, to farsee, to divine, tell, predict, or to see the future. It also means to give promise of, for example, the approaching storm clouds augur rain. You know, the storm clouds are a foretelling, a foreshadowing of the rain to come. Along with these meanings, an augur, or augurs, were also religious officials in ancient Rome that were considered diviners, farseers, foretellers, soothsayers, prophets, and these augurs would augur and predict future events to come. So it would seem that the auger part of the auger of Dunlane is just literally this definition. He foretells future events. The auger of Dunlane quite literally augurs. We will get back to the significance of this later as far seeing in the Elder Scrolls is very rare and very powerful and not to be dismissed as a common magician's folly. But before we move on from the word augur, here is a very interesting discovery. At Skyrim's release, there was only one other mention of an augur within the Elder Scrolls universe. We will get onto The Elder Scrolls Online a little later, as that game came out years after The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's release, and The Elder Scrolls Online introduced another Augur, the Augur of the Obscure. But for right now, at Skyrim's release, the only other mention of the word Augur is in the book The Legend of Red Eagle, which as you probably know, is a tome that retells the tale of a legend within the Reachman's history, a warrior named Red Eagle. So the opening of this book reads, and I quote, Long ago a child was born in the Sundered Hills. They named him Phalan, which means Red Eagle in the tongue of the Reach. For the screeching bird called it greeted his birth and the crimson blooms on the autumn hills. Thus begun his legend, Reach Child, born under auspicious skies, his very name the colour of blood. Ten kings ruled the Reach in those days, and though men were free, the people were scattered and warred amongst themselves. The Augurs foresaw the boy's destiny, a warrior without peer, first and foremost lord of the Reach, chosen to unite all under his name. Now the book goes on to tell Red Eagle's tale, and that is all well and good, but that last part of the passage we read, the augurs, which again at Skyrim's release is the only mention of an augur or augurs within the Elder Scrolls' history. And these augurs were a rank or a position within the Reachman's culture and society. So the only known group of people 
with anyone called augurs within their society is the Reachmen, who just happen to already be on our minds, no thanks to the primal effigies found within the Midden, where the Augur of Dunlane is found. But the Reachmen connections are about to bolster their ranks. So we've figured out the Augur bit of his name, but the Augur of where? Dunlane. But what's Dunlane? Well, Dunlane, locally known as Dunlane Falls, is actually a township within the province of High Rock. It was only present in the Elder Scrolls 1 arena and is not found or mentioned in any other game. Although, in the Elder Scrolls Online, there is a rare flower that grows in northeastern High Rock called the Dunlane Daisy, which, curiously, completely off topic, some people are allergic to and can ignite pollen allergies. Anyway, in Arena, we can see that much like the rare flower, the Dunlane Daisy, the township of Dunlane itself is located in the northeastern section of High Rock, which has been known as many things, but most commonly it is referred to as Rothgar. The northeastern half of Rothgar is known as the Western Reach. So you know the Reach in Skyrim. Well, that same region, the Jurassic Mountains, just on the other side. Now, do you know who comes from this area, the Reach? That's right, the Reachmen, which you'd likely know better as the Forsworn, who are actually one of the many tribes of Reachmen. Now, the Reachmen are an offshoot population of ancient Bretons, despite both Bretons and Reachmen claiming they are not related. They are in fact of the same stock, descending from the Keptu clan of Needs. So, even though the Reachmen are sometimes referred to as a separate race, they are in fact Breton by blood. Now, these Reachmen keep tribalistic traditions and root their culture in ancient magics, which have been forgotten by most of Tamriel, but we'll get back to their magics in a minute. So the Augur of Dunlane originated or is at least associated with Dunlane to a point where it's become part of his name. No doubt he had a normal name in his human life, but since his hmm, transformation, he is now simply known as the Augur of Dunlane. So he has the title of a Reachman and comes from a place within the Western Reach which is where the Reachmen come from. Also, in the game files, the Augur of Dunlane is marked as a Breton, which even further cements the fact that he is from High Rock, but more specifically from Dunlane. Now you might just be starting to see why we can find all of these strange, occult, and frankly familiar totems that remind us of the Forsworn or Reachmen culture down in the Midden. As we know, the Augur of Dunlane was pushing beyond the boundaries of academically known magics. So it seems like the Midden was where the Augur of Dunlane conducted experiments and rituals in his human life, away from the prying eyes of his peers at the College of Winterhold. So I do believe that the Augur of Dunlane in life was a prodigal sorcerer, as both Tolfdir and Colette inform us of his accolades. He was a brilliant student, an accomplished wizard, delved into magic in a way none had seen before. The Augur was a brilliant mage, truly inspired, mastered spells others could barely comprehend. He was especially gifted when it came to restoration. As he was, and I quote, a brilliant student, an accomplished wizard, he delved into magic in a way that none had seen before. The Augur was a brilliant mage, truly inspired, mastered spells others could barely comprehend. So this guy, the Augur of Dunlane, was no average mage. The way he is spoken about, you might as well be talking about one of the famous mages from the Elder Scrolls histories. So while we gain a clear gauge of his prolificacy and the well-defined fact that he was, a wizard capable of great and unfamiliar magics. What we don't get explained is this line. He was a brilliant student, an accomplished wizard, delved into magic in a way none had seen before. 
Well, what does that mean? The magics least understood are forgotten ones, ancient ones, lost to time, or used by unstudied cultures. Given the Augur's apparent Reachman roots, it could be very possible that he had training or access to these widely forgotten primal nature magics passed down and taught to him by the magically inclined ranks of the Reachman tribes. The shamans, the augurs, the witchmen, the gravesingers, or most likely of all, the source of their power, the Hag Ravens. Now the Reachmen are primitive and tribal in culture. They have no real societal systems, you know, like governing bodies or institutions as we know them in modern day Tamriel. So trying to define their magics in a modern day Tamrielic lexicon is difficult because no one really knows what it is in an academic sense. The Reachman's magics is often referred to as an advanced hedge magic, a kind of self-taught, homemade, or informal study and understanding of the magical arts. Academics have observed the Reachman magic and given it broad and unspecific definitions. Reach magic strikes me as wild and unpredictable. Whereas the Reachman shamans don't even consider it magic, but instead a simple connection to the earth bones. You see the world with different eyes, outsider. Magic is a word used by cowards who fear its power, or fools who think they can control it. We are connected to the land. Nothing more, nothing less. Which? For us here and now, trying to solve a pretty serious mystery makes it damn hard to define. For example, a fireball is quite easy to categorize as a destruction spell, but when a hag raven turns into a murder of crows, what kind of magic is that? Is it alteration? Is it conjuration? Illusion? Thaumaturgy? Transportation magic? Beast forming? Like what is that? How does one define that type of magic when it has not been studied at all? Well, with that thought in your mind, if the Augur of Dunlane was equipped with these informal Reachman magics and abilities, then came to the College of Winterhold and performed them, his fellow students of the college would have witnessed him casting these unfamiliar spells, rendering the other students unable to define exactly what he was doing, as they're dealing with ancient and primal sorcery. But all they have to look at it through is their lens of modern day magical definitions in Tamriel. So to his fellow students, the Augur of Dunlane's Reachman magics could very well have been seen and described as he delved into magic in a way that none had seen before, or he mastered spells that others could barely comprehend. Because, yeah, no one at the college had seen that magic before or tried to comprehend it. This is a very interesting path of thought, and one I believe to be the direct course of truth. So what do we know about the Reachmen and their magic? Well, while, like any culture in Tamriel, there are naturally, magically inclined people within their populations, the Reachmen are especially unique as a culture, as their primary source of the rather esoteric nature magics that the Reachmen's shamans, augurs, witchmen and gravesingers possess, is actually gifted to them by witches, hags and of course the hag ravens. In the same way an academic sacrifices time and thought to gain knowledge and power, the Reachmen also sacrifice for knowledge and power. Their sacrifices and rituals are just much more tangible. The classic things like animal sacrifices, dancing, chanting, erecting effigies, totems and fetishes, applying woad war paint, tattoos, and then shambling into the darker side of their culture, flagellation, tribal scarring, bloodbathing, dismemberment, burning at the stake, live sacrifices, cannibalistic feats, with some clans even being known to sacrifice children. 
children by cutting out their still beating hearts. These rituals are performed in exchange for power. To and from who? Well, that's a good question. We do know that raw power arcs through the Reachmen shamans, witchmen, and gravesingers. These shamans converse with hated hag ravens through ecstatic ceremonial heresy. Sacrifices are made and flesh is the feast. This communion allows the witchmen to acquire nature magic from or at least through the Hag Ravens. Now, Hag Ravens play an interesting part in all of this, as Reachmen clans and tribes are sometimes found to be matriarchal, with their leader, their matriarch, often being a Hag Raven. Interestingly, though, Hag Ravens aren't necessarily part of the Reachmen's ranks, as there are Witch Covens and Lone Hag Ravens that have no relation to the Reachmen at all. But for the most part, they are often found leading a clan or tribe of Reachmen. Now, Hag Ravens were once witches or hags, usually of Breton descent, as they appear to only exist in High Rock and Skyrim. Although their numbers are much greater in Western Skyrim towards the Reach compared to the rest of the Snowy Province. Now, while they were once human, they have undergone a ritual, an exchange, trading in their humanity for access to powerful magics. This transformation they undergo infuses their entire beings with elements of that power, quite literally. As we see in Skyrim, Hagraven feathers fortify conjuration and Hagraven claws fortify enchanting. The magical, bolstering effects of consuming physical parts of a Hagraven is noted in the Herbalist's Guide to Skyrim. And I quote, I found myself capable of comprehending enchantments that I had believed mystifying after ingesting the mixture, and have passed this knowledge onto several court wizards who were grateful for the knowledge. So, Hag Ravens themselves, their very being, their very bodies, are imbued with this power. This is very important for a theory later on. Sadly, we truly do not know where this power comes from, but we can make some very clear, educated guesses. As there are examples of Reachman tribes worshipping a variety of deities, more esoterically, they have religious roots with an unknown pantheon simply known as the Old Gods, and carry effigies and totems in the image of unknown higher powers. But primarily and more familiarly, they seem to worship the Daedric Princes, or at least a select few of the darker, more primal and chaotic ones. The Daedric Princes are likely the host of this old god's pantheon, as the Reachmen don't refer to the Daedric Princes as Daedric Princes, but instead call them the Great Spirits, or Old Spirits. Daedra? Oh, the Spirits. The Old Ones. Yes, I've heard them called that. The world is full of whispers, for those with the patience to hear. Most them bloods are just too busy begging pardons from dead gods to pay attention. Pity. Daedra, spirits, crows, it's all the same. Where you see evil gods, we see teachers. Cruel ones, for certain. But that's the world, right? A stone will kill you if it strikes your head. But left in the same stone makes us strong. Revere may be too strong a word. Our relationship with the spirits relies on negotiation, on giving and receiving what is expected. We look to the great spirit nocturnal for guidance, but our wards honor Hersin, Molag Baal, and Namira as well. The spirits we revere follow their own whims. We have an understanding, however. As long as we make our offerings in good faith, the spirits provide their blessings. Reachman clans worship these spirits, or Daedric Princes as we know them, but only a handful of them, namely Namira, Molagbal, Malakath, Mehrunes Dagon, Hersene, and Vermina. Inside Crowswood, a pocket of Nocturnal's realm of oblivion, the Evergloam, 
we can also find the crow's spell of binding, left by a hag raven known as Crow Mother, who names and channels several princes for their blessing in this binding. And I quote, by the snare of her scene and the trail of Namira's slime, I bind this place three times seven times. By Malakath's curse and the skull of Amina, I bind thee to this summoning arena. By the razor of Dagon and by the chains of Malagbal, when the time is at hand, you will answer to my call. So, we can observe that the Hag Ravens and in turn the Reachmen worship at the very least these named princes. But there is a grand prince of worship among all the Reachmen, Hersey, the Daedric Prince of the Hunts, and the father of man beasts, master of beasts, and master of the hunt. He possesses the most naturalistic and primal roots within nature when compared to the other Daedric Princes, making him and his aspects a clear choice for worship when it comes to a primitive and tribal people, such as the Reachmen and their matrons, the Hag Ravens. Even if we look at the Reachman clothing, it appears to be an attempt to mimic the image of Hersey with ragged leathers and furs, and of course, the signature elk skull crown of Hersey's, which is actually the skull of Yifir's champion, the Grat Elk. It is not known how this relationship between the Reach folk and the Daedric princes begun, namely that with Hersey. But it is said that the Reachmen believe the rocks, rushing water, towering peaks, and stunted thickets of Juniper are a gift from Hersin and are to be fiercely defended. Hersin also created lycanthropes, werewolves, werebears, werebores, and the like, which interestingly, being a werewolf amongst the Reachmen is considered a blessing and not a curse. So clearly, the Reachmen have a powerful connection to Hersin, and given Hersin merged man with beast and created all manner of lycanthropes, it would appear that he is most likely the architect of the venerated commingling of hag and raven. So all in all, it seems without a doubt Hagravens are the doing of Hersene, and in turn would make Hersene responsible for the mysterious and primal nature magics that Hagravens possess and pass onto their Reachmen followers. Now these unidentified magics equip Hag Ravens with a range of primeval and naturistic abilities. They can cast destruction spells, such as fireballs and frostbolts, seeming to be their favourite amongst their arsenal. Also, possessing the ability to conjure pools of flames on the ground beneath their enemy's feet. Hag Ravens can summon murders of crows. By the way, a murder is the plural of crow. So a bunch of crows is called a murder of crows, in case you were getting confused there. Anyway, hag ravens can summon murders of crows to swarm their enemies, and even summon flaming crows to create a feathered firestorm. They can also teleport short distances in a plume of feathers, a most annoying ability. They can curse one with diseases, they have the ability to poison their foes, on the flip side, they possess an array of restoration spells to heal themselves and allies, of course. Oh, and most famously, they possess the ability to remove the beating heart of a Reachman and replace his or her heart with an enchanted briar fruit, which is known as a briar heart, the same name that dons the now revived Reachman briar hearts. Who? always seem to be crowned with an elk antler headpiece, again mimicking the image of Hersin, the Daedric Prince who is seemingly responsible for these great powers the Hag Ravens possess. Heart of the Morn, bones of the wild, life forsworn, rise from death, blood above our blood. Now, just between you and I, there is one other very unique ability the Hag Ravens possess, 
but we'll get onto that a little later on, as it is the keystone to bridging a few vital components of this theory. So, what's in oblivion? Does any of this have to do with the Augur of Dunlane? Well, his substantial magical powers must have come from somewhere. While, sure, there are extraordinarily talented wizards and witches through Tamriel's history, they are quite rare, and the Augur of Dunlane just so happens to come from a place where the local tribes and their matrons sacrifice for great and powerful primal magics. The kind of great power that the Augur of Dunlane seemed to have exercised while at the College of Winterhold, mastering magics others couldn't comprehend, delving into magic in a way that none had seen before. The hallmarks of something special, suspicious and unfamiliar to the modern academic magical institution of the College of Winterhold. So did the Augur of Dunlane make sacrifices to her scene to gain his power? Were these powers bestowed upon him by a tribe matron, a Hagraven? Well, in one way or another, yes, I do think so. And you'll learn why in the coming minutes. He certainly seemed to have the power and mastery of unknown magics to suggest this. But his lack of barbarity and the fact he attended and studied at a civilized school of magic, the College of Winterhold, makes me think that he wasn't bound to the Reachman tribes in his adult life. Maybe he was. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was sent to learn all he could to bring it back to the Reachman uprising to be used in their wars to come. It was said that he was obsessed with power, which led to his ultimate demise. Maybe he was trying to amass an arcane payload and bless his people with it, or use it as a weapon. Maybe he was birthed into a Reachman clan, but broke away and brought with him aspects of his Reachman culture to Winterhold. It's a feasting hall of options, so take your pick and fill your platter. But I have conjured a rather unique theory that you are going to enjoy. And it's also the most viable one. And of course, I have amassed a whole Khajiit caravan worth of evidence and clues. So firstly, in the Elder Scrolls Online in Northern Bankarai, at the southern tip of the Western Reach, an area overrun by Reachmen, we can find a law book called A Life Barbaric and Brutal, which is a recount written by Arthenice Belloc of her eight years as a slave to the Reachman tribe, the Crow Wife Clan. It recalls the various barbaric acts and traditions of the Crow Wife clan that she witnessed, but it also sheds light on some very previously undocumented hmm, possibilities. The Crow Wife clan was led by a Hagraven matron called Cloavdra, who was a vile and twisted beast, as most Hagravens are. Her hag husband was a man called Cointhak, who was a grave singer and feared by all within the tribe. But this text reveals something incredible on the last page, and I quote, It was during my sixth summer as a slave of the Crow Wives. <laughs> I'd crossed the hated Karth 11 times. But during this sixth summer, it was then I began to attract the unwanted attention of Iknuel, the loutish son of Cloavdra and Cointhak. There's more to the story, but that's all the bits we need to know. So Cloavdra, the Hag Raven, and her hag husband, Cointhak, a Reachman, had a child together. This reveals that Hag Ravens can in fact have children with human men producing a child that, given its lack of description, is likely physically human-looking. Although we cannot be sure, as this child's physical appearance is never described, if it was some kind of strange raven child abomination, surely the writer would mention that. But the child being more human in appearance, or at least being more human in appearance than Hagraven, 
does make sense, considering the Hagravens were human before undergoing their bestial transformation. Furthering this evidence of Hagraven offspring, during the second era, in the southeastern corner of the rift in Skyrim, there was an arena called the Blessed Crucible. Around it, we can find plaques that detail the champions of this arena over the years. The first champion was Alirus the Shroud. Alirus, the first champion of the Blessed Crucible, held that title for four decades. She was renowned for her skill with illusion magic and her deft swordplay. Few were able to match her skill in the arena or her favor with the crowd. And we can see at the bottom that she was defeated by someone known simply as Crowbringer who has their own plaque which notes some suspiciously familiar abilities. Crowbringer was said to possess the powers of the Hagravens, allowing him to transform into a murder of crows and attack his foes from a hundred directions at once. It was perhaps inevitable that his reign as champion would be cut short, by one who utilized the powers of light. When Crowbringer used his transformation powers against Hagroth the Righteous, a blinding light incinerated the crow forms, leaving nothing in their place but the brimstone crown itself. Now this is very interesting indeed, as there are no examples anywhere within the lore of a man undergoing a Hagraven transformation. Yet, there is an example of a Hagraven giving birth to a son with Eknuel, Cloavdra and Cointhax's son that we read about just a few minutes ago. So the fact that Crowbringer had these powers that have only ever been observed being used by Hagravens, to me heavily suggests that he is in fact the offspring of a Hagraven having his mother's Hagraven abilities passed on to him while maintaining the form of a man. Please cast your mind back a minute or two when I made the point about Hagraven claws and Hagraven feathers bolstering a consumer's magical capabilities and understanding of magic. Well, Imagine the powers that you would inherit if you were birthed by a Hagraven. They'd be immense. You would have these fortifications to your magical abilities permanently in your very DNA. Much like powers possessed and displayed by Crowbringer, or perhaps the Augur of Dunlane too, with his unmatched comprehension of magic and mastering of magic that none had seen before. So where's this theory going? Well, I'll ask the question, was the Augur of Dunlane the son of a Hagraven? Well, he came from the right area geographically. He now has the title Augur, a title which has only previously been observed within the Reachman's culture. There are Reachman totems and fetishes in the Midden where the Augur clearly spent some time in his mortal life, given that this is where he can now be found. He had unmatched magical powers and an understanding of magic foreign to the academically trained mages of the College of Winterhold. Not only was he said to be masterful beyond comprehension, but it's specifically noted that he was especially gifted in the School of Restoration. This is important because remember that one other unique ability that Hagravens have that I said we'd get onto? Well, let's get onto it. And it is quite substantial. Hagravens in Rothgar. Again, Rothgar is the northeastern corner of High Rock, the same place where Dunlane is located. Well, Hagravens from this exact same area have been observed performing something very special. When one of their fellow Reachmen dies in combat, the Hagravens bring them back to life. Now, we've seen something very similar with necromancers. 
But this is different, as the resurrected Reachmen are not bound to the caster, the Hagravens in this case. So if the Hagraven is killed, the revived Reachmen still continues to live. They are not a reanimated corpse at the mercy of the Hagraven. They are simply alive again. This has been observed and documented by NPCs as a strange form of necromancy, but I believe this conclusion to be incorrect. It's not necromancy. The resurrected are not bound to the caster, which would not make it the puppeteering of the dead. So to me, it doesn't fall into the facet of necromancy. It's resurrection, permanent resurrection, Surely, if anything, this would be classed as restoration, the revival of the dead, not reanimation, but revival, to freely and independently live and breathe again. Of course, please correct me if I am wrong, but surely, if anything, this would be the highest and most powerful form of restoration magic. Restoring a dead person back to life, independent of the Resurrector. And don't forget, my fellows, Restoration is the school of magic the Augur of Dunlane excelled at beyond all other magics. It seems like he and the Hagravens share this almost divine grasp on the school of Restoration, once more connecting the two as if they were related. <laughs> oh, and there is one other major piece of evidence that to me completely concretes the fact that the Augur of Dunlane is the child of a Hag Raven. For this, I had to dig deep and it can be found within the creation kit. So if we open Skyrim's creation kit and load Skyrim's game files, then search for Augur. We can find the Augur of Dunlane's character profile. In here, we will discover an array of very interesting and telling things. While the Augur of Dunlane is an orb of light, when we encounter him in game, he actually has a uniquely assigned and designed human character in the game files. As we can see, all of the character customization sliders and such have been manually set by a developer specifically, creating a unique looking human as the Augur of Dunlane. And guess what he looks like? Well, he looks like this. An absolute mess to be sure. One of the ugliest characters that I've ever seen. At first I thought, what the hell is this? This is the goofiest looking dude I've seen since, since I looked in the mirror this morning. But then it clicked as I was getting footage of a Hagraven. Oh my god, he looks like a Hagraven man. The Augur of Dunlane has a specifically designed human character in the game files that has been made to look almost too perfectly like a Hagraven spawn. He has the gaunt face, the huge nose, the witch's chin, the thinning straggly hair, the bulbous bare brow, the dead crone eyes. He could not look more exactly like what I would imagine the son of a Hagraven to look like. And a detail that is probably easily missed is on this page in the creation kit. His eyes are set to male eyes human demon and his eyebrows are set to brows male humanoid 12 no brow. The names of those settings aside, he has completely blacked out eyes and no eyebrows, which to be honest were two options I didn't even know were available, but these two features are exactly what Hagravens have. They have no eyebrows and they have completely black dead crone eyes, which just so happens to be the exact settings on the Augur of Dunlane's human form, while at the same time, 
the rest of his face has clearly been modelled off of his mother too. To me, this is beyond suspicious. This is just tangible and observable evidence that the Augur of Dunlane is in fact the son of a hag raven. In this window here, we can see that his race is Breton, so again, his race fits the bill perfectly. Interestingly, his height is set to maximum, and his weight is set to minimum, so he is thin and gangly. Again, a physicality that you would associate with a hag raven. Now, this little viewing window can be hard to appreciate, so I have recreated his character in-game by perfectly matching all of the settings that we see here in the creation kit. And looky here, the Augur of Dunlane, the most hag raven looking male Breton in all of Tamriel at least, that I have seen. So, I'll ask the question again, was his mother a hag raven? I definitely think so, and I would confidently take this evidence to court, or to the Elder Council, or whoever would like to see it. He is Breton, he is from Dunlane in Rothgar, the Western Reach where the Reachmen come from. He has the title of Augur, which has only previously been observed being used as a title in Reachmen tribes. He delved into magic in a way that none had seen before. He could master spells others could barely comprehend almost as if his magical understandings were permanently bolstered by effects, the same effects that we have observed that are present in alchemy when consuming parts of a Hagraven. The midden where he resides is filled with totems and effigies floating with or even matching those found in Forsworn culture, who are again a tribe of Reachmen. We've seen that hag ravens have hag husbands, who are men, and together they can produce children. We also have seen that their children, who are men, can possess their hag raven abilities as observed with Crowbringer. We have seen hag ravens performing permanent resurrection, a divine ability that just so happens to lie exactly in the same school that the Augur mastered above all others, that being restoration magic. And to bring all of the ingredients together, his character looks like an actual hag raven, or more fittingly and relevantly, like a man and a hag raven mixed together. To me, it is clear as day. The Augur of Dunlane is in fact the son of a hag raven. He is a hag prince. Now, this revelation about the Augur of Dunlane's origins are very interesting and could play some part in the coming questions. So now we've found the most likely roots about who the Augur of Dunlane was in his mortal life. The next mystery to address is what happened to the Augur of Dunlane. How did he go from Birdman to a glowing ball of light? Well, Tolthir sheds the most light on this ball of light. He was a brilliant student, an accomplished wizard, delved into magic in a way none had seen before. But I think he became too focused on just how much power he could acquire. That's what led to the accident. What accident? Do you remember what I first told you? About how not being able to control magic could destroy you? I didn't simply mean it could kill you. The Augur's accident is another very real type of a life destroyed. Well, it's been described as an accident. I can't imagine it was intentional. Something must have gone wrong, and he ended up in the state he's in now, fused to the energies that flow through the college. He thinks that the Augur was driven to his own demise, trying to acquire as much power as possible. But there is no other evidence of this claim, other than Tolfdir just thinks that's what happened. But Tolfdir might be holding his cards closer to his chest than we suspect, which we'll get onto a little later. Teaser. 
I think he knows a lot more than he reveals. Anyway, Tolfdir clarifies that whatever happened to the Augur of Dunlane is described as an accident, as he couldn't imagine that it would have been intentional. This is important to note, as it could have very well been intentional. Tolfdir also mentions that the Augur is somehow now fused with the magics that flow through the college. This is a very strange occurrence, and I cannot find any examples of this happening elsewhere. A conscious being fusing with magicka in a particular location, or at all for that matter, while also remaining a cognitive entity that's very strange indeed. Of course, we'll get onto what he is or very well could be later. But because we don't really have any examples of the outcome, it's hard to define or specify the process. So it seems when trying to define exactly what happened to the Augur of Dunlane, we're going to have a very hard time. Given he is apparently fused to the magics that surround the college, we can assume that he was performing a spell, a ritual perhaps, that involved these very magics. Some speculate that his obsession with power led him to trying to absorb that very magic that flows through the college, which in turn led to his physical form overloading, like putting too much air into a balloon. His body, the vessel, could not contain the quantity of magicka flowing into it, and he went kapuf, exploded. And in one way or another, his soul fused with the magics that surround the College of Winterhold. Again, something like this is a basic educated guess and has no grounding in evidence apart from the observable outcome. Now, if what happened to the Augur of Dunlane was an accident, I would consider it a happy accident as we can see plenty of characters all throughout Skyrim who have performed magical experiments which have ended in uh, failure and often death. Even at the College of Winterhold alone, we have many examples. Whether it be Brelina making the player's vision green or turning the Dragonborn into various animals or the four now ex-students whose remains we can find scattered throughout the hold of Winterhold, who died while experimenting in various magical arts. You can see them in full in the Curating Curious Curiosities video that I have done for the hold of Winterhold if such things interest you. But uh, even the senior member of the college, Arniel Gain, appears to zero sum when he uses Kagradak's tool Keening on the warped soul gem. Possibly the exact same thing that happened to the Dwemer. Point being, it probably wasn't intentional on Arniel Gain's part. We also, of course, have the four students that tried to bind the pirate Dramora of the Ubesian, Velek Sane. Uh, and again, I have a full video on his story if you want to check it out. It's actually really cool, and I'd highly recommend it. You'd enjoy it. Anyway, four students, in some kind of ritualistic experiment, bound Velek Sane to the gauntlet and their four rings. But in the process exploded, as we can see with the parts and gore splattered and scattered around the room, and their souls were sent to oblivion. We'll get back to this a little later, as it might play a part in the Augur's story. Anyway, the point of all of that is that we have plenty of examples of magical experiments going wrong. All of them resulted in failure in some sense, and most of them just ended in death. Like plain, old, boring, you're gone kind of death. But with the Augur, he is something else. He went from human to a far-seeing, omnipresent, non-corporeal entity. These are the kind of traits associated with the Daedra and the Aedra, or other hying, ascended entities. Not to say that he is one, but his current being is something divine. Divine in a literary sense, not an Aedric one. 
So surely something like this, master wizards, well some at least, would thrive to achieve, an ascendance in a sense. So was this an accident? It very well could have been an accident, but if it was, it was a very, very happy accident. Considering all of the other accidents we can find ended with predictable certain death. Whereas, the Augur of Dunlane is now a conscious astral being. So given we have almost nothing to go off, I think asking what happened to the Augur of Dunlane might be the wrong question. Maybe we should ask under what circumstances did this transformation take place under? Well. I believe that it may very well have been related to the Great Collapse. So did the Augur of Dunlane cause the Great Collapse, or was he involved with it at all? For the uninitiated, the Great Collapse was a disaster that took place 79 years before the time the game of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim takes place, in which a rather aptly named Great Collapse occurred where the majority of the city of Winterhold crumbled and plummeted into the Sea of Ghosts. But the College of Winterhold remained standing, while all the land between it and the city of Winterhold shattered into the ocean below. This naturally aroused suspicion amongst the locals, and their suspicions might just be well placed. Now, the two prevailing theories as to the cause of the Great Collapse are weak at best. The first is that the eruption of Red Mountain caused quakes throughout Tamriel, and weakened the natural foundations below the city. A few things to note here is that Red Mountain and the College of Winterholds aren't exactly close. They are about a quarter of a continent away from each other, and like Winterhold, there are plenty of similar cliffy areas between the College of Winterhold and Red Mountain that did not suffer the same fate and remain standing. Most importantly though, the eruption of Red Mountain happened 117 years before the Great Collapse happened. So blaming a seismic event that occurred six generations beforehand and took place a province away is limp at best. Now the second accepted theory is what was passed off by the college as the cause, which was natural disaster due to storm erosion. Now this may be true, but as we'll see, the patrons of Winterhold did not trust mages nor their college, and they still don't. And they do not accept this theory of the eroding storms at all. There are a number of reasons for this, and we'll learn about them all shortly. It's important to understand fully this friction between the College of Winterhold and the city of Winterhold, as it plays a part in my theory about the Augur of Dunlane being the cause of the Great Collapse. So firstly, 79 years ago, at the time of the Great Collapse, the then Archmage wrote a letter to the Jarl of Winterhold. This letter can be found in a book aptly named On the Great Collapse. <clears throat> so let's have a read. Firstly, please allow me to offer my sincere condolences. I understand that you, like many others, have lost family and you have my deepest sympathies. I also understand that some of your council have placed the blame for this horrible disaster on my colleagues at the college. While I can certainly appreciate the shock and the scope of recent events and the desire to comprehend what has happened, I must strongly urge you to consider the full situation. You know as well as any the college's history and reputation in Winterhold. It has long been a source of pride for your city, a unique fixture in Skyrim. Some of the greatest wizards have studied here, and the college has always promoted positive relations with the other provinces of Tamriel. It is well known that those relations have been, shall we say, strained over the last few decades. 
After the Oblivion Crisis, it was only natural that the people of Skyrim showed a distrust for mages, even though the vast majority of us actively worked to counter the actions of the Mythic Dawn cult. The college expected such a reaction and hoped that distrust would fade over time. And then the Red Year. No one foresaw the explosion of Red Mountain or the devastating effect it would have on the Dunma culture. Your predecessor was kind enough to welcome many of the refugees, particularly those who could contribute to the college's studies. We were quite grateful. When Solstheim was generously offered to the Dunma as a new home, I was surprised as any. I did not, however, share the apparent expectation that all Dark Elves would leave Skyrim. It did not go unnoticed that many in Winterhold were unhappy at how many mages chose to stay at the college rather than relocate. And now the storms that have racked the coast of Skyrim for close to a year have finally broken but at great cost to us all. This great collapse that has devastated Winterhold was unexpected, I assure you. That the college has remained unaffected is only a testament to the protective magics placed around it so long ago. It in no way implies that we were somehow prepared specifically for this event, and is certainly no indication that the college was somehow responsible. I certainly would never hold you accountable for the gossip spread amongst the people of Winterhold. I would urge you, though, to not allow that gossip to take root and become a commonly held belief. I do not wish to see our relationship crumble like Winterhold has. I assure you, the college will remain here a very, very long time. Now, this almost threatening letter reveals the tension between the college and the city, in which the then Archmage blames the Great Collapse on the recent storms that apparently eroded the coastline, and assures the then Jarl of Winterhold that the mages of the college had nothing to do with it. Despite the college remaining unharmed due to protective wards, which we'll get onto later. But these tensions and distrust have all but dissipated in modern day Skyrim, as we'll see just by talking with the people of the college and the populace of Winterhold. So, Onmond, why do Nords have a problem with the college? Well, look at the evidence. Nords generally don't trust magic, so it's not off to a good start. Throw in the Oblivion Crisis, which was caused by magic users, and the troubles now with the Aldmeri Dominion, who are elves and magic users. And finally, take the fact that the college is the only thing left standing after most of Winterhold was destroyed. It's all fairly damning. Now despite this chain of reasons the local Nords don't like mages, there are still some within the city who don't blame the college such as Kraldar, who will give us some very interesting and relevant history. Excuse me, do you find the college dangerous? Goodness, no. They're simply scholars. They mean no one harm. I've had several conversations with Archmage Arryn over the years. Oh, he's perfectly polite, if a bit guarded. Hmm, bit friendly with the Archmage, are you? Where's he putting his wand? Please, tell me about the history of Winterhold. I'm afraid the Winterhold you see before you is somewhat... underwhelming. I can assure you, though, that it was quite something in its prime. An early capital of Skyrim, you know. Sadly, the Oblivion Crisis took its toll on Winterhold, in more ways than one. Then, the Great Collapse swallowed most of our beloved city. Clarify for me. How did the Oblivion Crisis impact Winterhold? You may have noticed the college, just to the north there. Very prestigious place. Mages from all over Tamriel traveled here to seek knowledge. After the Oblivion Crisis was over, many felt that magic users were to blame. Elves, to be specific. 
It created a great deal of tension. A good many dark elves were driven from the city, and people became uncomfortable with the presence of the college. Please explain the Great Collapse to me. Just about 80 years ago, there was a terrible disaster. The cliffs overlooking the Sea of Ghosts collapsed, taking most of Winterhold with them. In the middle of it all, the college was practically untouched. Many of the survivors were suspicious. Some believed the mages were behind the whole thing, and others felt they could have at least prevented it. Archmage Arryn assures me that his people had nothing to do with it, and I believe him. But Winterhold never recovered. Now while Kraldar provides some brilliant insight into the situation, he doesn't share Winterhold's general spite towards the college. We should visit with the Jarl, Korit of Winterhold, for the town's consensus. And before we even get to talk to him, we'll get an earful about those damned mages at the college. That wizard is still at the inn. I can't believe Dagger allows him to stay there. This is what it's come to. No one seems to care what they've done to our home. It's clear that memories are far too short. And it's clear money matters more to Dagor than honor. Ours is the only family left that truly cares what happens to Winterhold. Courier will be the first to tell you that if it weren't for that college, we'd all be better off. I agree with him. What's your business here in Winterhold? I am here for the college. Hmm. Should have known. Not that it matters anymore. No one bothers coming to Winterhold for any other reason. Please tell me about Winterhold's history. What's there to tell? It's mostly gone now, thanks to those damn mages in the college. Someday there'll be proof they caused the Great Collapse. Most of the city just dropping off into the sea. That doesn't just happen. I'm getting the vibe that you have a problem with the college. I do. And if you count yourself among their numbers, then you've blood on your hands as well. There's nothing left of Winterhold. Nothing. Everyone knows it's the college's fault that the sea swallowed our city. Still, they deny it. But we all know the truth. The college is the worst thing that's ever happened to Winterhold. Maybe to Skyrim. Those cursed mages. It's their fault Winterhold is gone. Few will admit it, but we know the truth about the Great Collapse. I don't care how many colleges they build, or how much the sea swallows up, I'll outlast them all. So, as we can see, the Jarl and a number of Winterhold's patrons do not trust the College of Winterhold one bit and hold them accountable for the Great Collapse. And they are right, if uh, some of my theories about the Augur of Dunlane hold true, of course. Finally, we'll hear from the Archmage himself to get his side of the story. Archmage, what caused the Great Collapse? No one is sure of the cause. Some believe the eruption of Red Mountain had far-reaching consequences that were only felt years later. I know there are some who have blamed the College, said that we were responsible, I assure you this is not the case. Go on, I want to hear more. The Sea of Ghosts practically came alive. No one was expecting it. Monstrous waves battered the shore for weeks on end. Winterhold was ancient and weathered, but it couldn't withstand the sea's fury. Entire districts of the city were lost overnight. The waves receded in time, but the damage was irreversible. Most residents of Winterhold abandoned what was left of the city. The college survived, and so here we remain. So now we understand how everyone around Winterhold feels about the Great Collapse. Let's get to my deep theories about the Augur of Dunlane being involved here. But to ponder so, we have to assume that the Augur of Dunlane was in fact alive at the time of the Great Collapse, which I believe to be very likely as we know, the Great Collapse took place 79 years ago, but we don't really have a clear gauge on when the Augur of Dunlane was alive and kicking. 
But when we speak to Colette Morenz about our dear Lambent friend, the Augur of Dunlane, she drops this little line. Perhaps I'll ask Tolfdir what really happened. I understand he was here at the time. She seems to be under the impression that Tolfdir was here at the College of Winterhold when whatever happened to the Augur happened. However, when we speak to Tolfdir about the Augur of Dunlane, he says this. Well, I suppose he wouldn't mind. It was all before my time, you understand. I've heard the stories, the, the same as anyone else. Hmm, now that's strange, as his information conflicts with Colette's. Why would she think that Tolfdir was around? Hmm, well I have a suspicion to believe that Tolfdir is intentionally distancing himself from the Augur of Dunlane, as is the College's wish. Because of course, if the Augur of Dunlane's accident date and the date of the Great Collapse align and word gets out about it, well, case closed. We would have the evidence that Winterhold and the other Nords need to prove that the College was responsible for the Great Collapse, or at least one of their members was, which could lead to the College's demise, which obviously the College doesn't want to happen. So if the College did know what caused the Great Collapse, they would keep it under wraps. And they sure seem to keep the Augur of Dunlane under some very tight wraps. So we'll get back to this point a little later, but with that idea in mind, it makes sense that Tolfdir, if he was here at the college when the Augur's accident happens, when asked about it, he would weave a different web to disconnect the two events those being the Great Collapse and the Augur of Dunlane's accident. Importantly, Tolfdir is also the only character that talks about the Augur of Dunlane with a human approach. As in, he talks about the Augur as if he is a person, almost like he knew him in life. Meanwhile, everyone else avoids the subject entirely or briefly mentions him and tells you to talk to someone else and discusses the Augur like some kind of object rather than a person. But Tolfdir says things like, Are you going to see him? Do tell him hello for me, won't you? Like their old pals, giving the Augur consideration, human attributes and courtesies. He then explains in a sympathetic manner how the Augur's life was destroyed. Do you remember what I first told you? about how not being able to control magic could destroy you? I didn't simply mean it could kill you. The Augur's accident is another very real type of a life destroyed. Well, it's been described as an accident. I can't imagine it was intentional. Something must have gone wrong, and he ended up in the state he's in now, fused to the energies that flow through the college. I've never felt it appropriate to ask him about it, about how that must feel, or I suppose, if he can feel at all. Again, it's like he knew him as a person. He's sorrowful, mournful, like he has personally lost someone close to him. Whereas, again, all the other mages at the college reference the Augur like some kind of divining artifact. What? The Augur? Oh no, I'm quite sure that's... He's nothing I'm involved in. No, no. Whereas Tolfdir seems to have much more emotion in his musings about the Augur. Something else very obscure is when Tolfdir says, It was all before my time, you understand. He inflects a tone that makes him sound much older than he normally sounds. It is very subtle, but once you notice it, it is very strange. Listen to this. Well, I suppose he wouldn't mind. It was all before my time, you understand. I've heard the stories, the same as anyone else. Notice how his voice changes and it sounds like he suddenly ages 100 years. Do be sure to say hello to him for me. It was all before my time, you see. Like Tolf, dear, what happened to you? Are you going to see him? Do tell him hello for me, won't you? It was all before my time, you understand. 
I don't know if this is intentional, but it is odd that his voice change takes place right as he's explaining how the August accident was all before his time. Like, he's trying to make himself seem really old, and therefore the Augur of Dunlane's accident even older. Again, trying to put as much time between the Augur's accident and the Great Collapse. A clever illusion to anyone unaware of his motives. Now, Tolthir is an old man, and he would have to be around 100 years old, at least in current day Skyrim, to have had been a member of the college during the Great Collapse 79 years ago. Which, again, I believe to be the results of the Org's accident. And while Tolfdir does look like an old man, he doesn't quite look 100 or older. But, as we know, magic can sustain a masterful wizard or witch's life well beyond their natural lifespan. All we need to do is look at someone like Devaith Fear, a Dunmo wizard who is thousands of years old, purely through his mastery of magic. He is so old in fact that he was once a Kaima before Azira cursed their race with ashen skin and red eyes, turning them into the Dunma, which took place in the year 700 of the First Era, around 4,000 years ago. So the concept of a masterful wizard such as Tolfdir being over 100 years old is laughably achievable. The Archmage also has this classic passing line of dialogue. What you learn here will last you a lifetime, several if you're talented. Now, Tolfdir is also the master of alteration magic at the college. So naturally, if anyone had altered their lifespan, it would be him. Interestingly, he also has heterochromia iridis. The colored part of the eye, the iris, is different colors in his two eyes. One is hazel and one is green. And while this does occur in nature in real life, when it comes to video games, well, nothing happens naturally. Everything's done on purpose by a developer. So, a developer had to consciously take the effort to make Tolfdir's eyes like this, which to me is a key clue in showing his ability to alter himself physically, whether it be intentional, unintentional, or just a side effect of a long life of alteration magic. So taking into account that he's an alteration master wizard and altering one's lifespan is a known ability of magic users, Tolftir is likely even older than he looks, and he looks quite old. So was Tolftir around 79 years ago at the college during the time of the Great Collapse? It's entirely plausible, and I think it is more likely than not. And if the Augur's accident was at this same time, then Tolftir was here and would have known the Augur of Dunlane in life, which would explain his empathy and sense of loss in regards to the Augur of Dunlane and his, and I quote, life destroyed. Now this concept of Tolfdin knowing the Augur of Dunlane and the Augur causing the Great Collapse doesn't stop here. When we ask the Archmage about the Augur of Dunlane, he says this. Has Tolfdir been telling stories again? I thought I made it quite clear that this was a subject inappropriate for conversation. Please, don't allow him to continue to discuss the subject. Suggesting that Tolfdir previously has talked about him quite a bit a little too much, and that the Archmage has had words with Tolfdir about how spreading knowledge of the Augur is not a topic for discussion. And why would he be against it? Well, to me it's clear the Augur is connected to something dangerous, something bad, a secret that must be kept hidden and forgotten. I mean, all we need to do is observe how some of the other college members react when the Augur is merely mentioned, like Enthir, for example, he will locate and deal with outlawed objects like black soul gems and daedra hearts. He also locates and purchases Keening, Kagranak's 
tool, which played a part in the disappearance of the Dwema and was used by the Nerevarine to destroy the heart of a god, the heart of Lorcan, at the core of Red Mountain, which led to the death of Dagoth Ur, another living god. So this guy deals with the most dangerous and profane tools, artifacts and trinkets. Yet when we mention the Augur of Dunlane, he is shaking in his boots. Enthir, you sell Daedra hearts, you surely can tell me about the Augur of Dunlane. Oh no, no, that won't do at all. Not my problem, not even a little. Take it to Tolf, dear. He's supposed to be looking after you lot. He can hook you up with an artifact that has killed two gods and an entire race. But the Augur, no, 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 not a chance. Terrified of the mere utterance of his name. So he knows something. He knows the potential ramifications of spreading awareness and knowledge of the Augur of Dunlane. All of the higher wizards are beyond cautious of talking about him, save for a few. Once pressured, Mirabel Irvine will say this. That's nothing you need to concern yourself with. Mirabel, I'm not asking. Tell me where the Augur is. Very well. It's not something often discussed as it might be misunderstood by the locals. Which is a fair enough explanation, but I think it is one designed so you stop asking questions. In reality, if the locals found out about the Augur of Dunlane, they would have the glove that fits. They'd have their evidence and they'd have their perpetrator. The proof needed to blame the college on the Great Collapse, which would have no positive outcomes for the College of Winterholds. Only bad things would come from that knowledge escaping the tight lock and key of the Master Wizards at the College of Winterholds. So the concept that the Augur of Dunlane played some part in the Great Collapse does make sense. Given all of the evasive and secretive approaches to the Augur of Dunlane when brought up as a topic. Okay, so if he was here or could have been here 79 years ago, how did he cause the Great Collapse? Well, there are a few quite plausible ways this could have happened. Firstly, the Great Collapse was in fact a natural disaster. The endless lament of the clawing waves of the ghastly brine that crashed and gnawed away at the coastal cliffs eroded enough of the foundations below the city to have it crumble into the sea of ghosts beneath leaving the city of Winterhold mostly destroyed, lying in ruin as drowned rubble. But, of course, the College of Winterhold miraculously remains standing. This is explained away as the doings of magical wards that were placed around the college long ago. Well, that's fine, but what wards? We don't have any evidence of these wards. Terrible things happen in the college, terrible things leave the college, and terrible things enter the college. I mean, vampires can get into the college and try and kill us. Cultists can enter and try and kill us. Dragons can swoop down and murder everyone. Magical anomalies aren't stopped from entering or exiting. The Eye of Magnus isn't stopped from entering and is not contained when it pops off. So, you know, there is a very long list of events and occurrences that highlight the fact that there are no magical barriers around the College of Winterhold, as none of their effects are perceivable or perceptible. But I do believe a ward was placed around the college at the time of the Great Collapse to prevent the college from collapsing, obviously. This makes more sense, as again, all of the evidence that we have in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim highlights that there is in fact not a ward to be seen currently protecting the college. Well, okay, someone activated a very large and magnificent ward, but who would be powerful enough to place a ward around a whole citadel such as the College of Winterhold? Someone who has an unmatched grasp of magic, specifically the tree in which wards belong, and which school of magic do wards come from? 
That's right, restoration. The School of Magic the Augur of Dunlane mastered and still masters above all others. I think we have found our Ward Warden. Now, as Tolfdir muses, the Augur of Dunlane appears to be fused with the magics that surround the college, suggesting that the Augur was dabbling with them to some extent at the time of his transformation. It's entirely possible that the Augur of Dunlane tapped into these magics using himself as a conduit to absorb as much magicka as he could, channeling a huge orbric source to be able to cast a monolithic protective ward around the College of Winterhold to stop it from collapsing. Performing such a spell would be quite a feat especially for someone who hadn't attempted such a ritual before. The requirements and after effects would be unknowable and unpredictable, such as the Augur of Dunlane ascending in some sense, from a mere mortal to a non-corporeal entity as we find him now. Interestingly, in the Reachman culture, some tribes perform totemic offering rituals in order to place protective wards around their settlements. So the concept of warding ones dwelling with magic would have been a familiar idea to a Reachman like the Augur of Dunlane. However, the execution of this mass scale protective spell holding up the college, the midden and the stone foundations is a huge task and one that was apparently so demanding that the augur was shed of his physical form, stripped of flesh, fused with the magics that surround the college and now he exists as an immortal, non-corporeal and omnipresent entity. This is the most noble theory, as he sacrificed himself, in a sense, to save his college. And while it is totally plausible, it's not as deep or dark as some of the places we're going to creep into. So let us visit the other end of the spectrum, but before we go there, we need to get some ground rules and law laid out that will be necessary and needed to appreciate fully the scope of my ultimate theory about the Augur of Dunlane causing the Great Collapse. So it is said that the first era Archmage Shalador founded the College of Winterhold and built the city of Winterhold with a single whispered spell. Whether this is a literal retelling of events or hyperbole of Shalador's great power is unknown. However, what is important is that Shalador, a legendary master wizard, came to this very location and in one way or another founded the college and the city. Now, why would he choose to build a known wide revered magical institution, the College of Winterhold, all the way out here. He could have built this anywhere, but he chose, well, at face value, a terrible spot. Well, with evidence, of course. I believe there to be a rich magical vein of energy or powerful source of something below the College of Winterhold. And this is what we see as the magic that flows through the college. The very magics that the Augur of Dunlane has supposedly fused with. In the Pocket Guide to the Empire, 3rd edition, we can find an interesting section about Skyrim, and I quote, Looking at virtually any vista in Skyrim, one is looking at the remains of a battlefield. The great Adric Cataclysm that brought Tamriel into existence in primeval times seems to have spent most of their fury in this northern land. So, if the Adra did spend more time creating Skyrim than any other of the provinces, if there were to be a location with residual pockets of Adric energy, deposits of power, stores of magicka, whatever it may be, it would not be surprising if we found that right here in Skyrim. We also have Blackreach, a massive cavern that spans all the way from the Reach in the west to Winterhold in the east. 
And while we do get to explore an area of Blackreach within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, in the Elder Scrolls Online, we get to explore even more sections of the cavern, where strange and wonderful magics, artifacts, machines, and excessively undefinable magical occurrences lie in wait. One of which is something known as the Dark Heart of Skyrim, which we'll get onto in a minute, as it might just be the keystone to the Augur's story including the Great Collapse. So, I believe that underneath the College of Winterhold is access to a great font of power, lurking underground, whatever it may be. You know, these things are hard to define, especially when we don't actually know that it's there. But, with this concept in mind, this would explain why Shalador chose to build the College of Winterhold here, because of the magics that were already present at the location the same magics that now flow through the College of Winterhold, which are the very magics that the Augur of Dunlane has fused with. Another reason I believe this ambient magic to be from a deeper, more ancient source than the College itself is a little something that the Augur of Dunlane says when we talk to him. It is a good path, one untraveled by many. It is a path that could save your college. When he references saving the College of Winterhold, his wording is strange and distanced. He is fused with the magics that flow through the College, which initially led me to think that he had become one with the College of Winterhold. But no, he says, save your college. It is a path that could save your college. He doesn't say, save me, save my college, save our college, save the college, but save your college. Despite him being one with the magics that flow through the College of Winterhold, that run through the foundations into every room of the institution, the Augur of Dunlane completely disconnects himself from the college itself, which makes me think that these flowing magics and the College of Winterhold are two completely separate things. And again, the college was just built here by Shalador because of these already existing magics. Now, the Augur of Dunlane may have also said, save your college, because he knows what is going to happen, as in we will become the Archmage. After all, he is an Augur, he can see into the future. He was referencing the college as if we were already in charge. Not to take away from my earlier very suspicious point about his complete disconnection to the college, but it is a curious addition to the mix. Now just while we are here and talking about Shalador and the nearby underground magics and obscure things of this ilk that populate Winterhold's subterrain, let me present some very strange findings that I have made. Archmage Shalador, a Nord Archmagus, who lived in the first era and had an understanding of magic that few have ever known. Well, he once lived in a place called the Fortress of Ice, which was said to be an ancient ruin located within the ice fields of the Hold of Winterhold. We actually get to visit this location in the Elder Scrolls 1 arena thousands of years after Shalador lived there. The exact time difference is unknown, as Shalador is only known to have lived in the first era and warred with the Dwemer in the 400th year. Though the first era spans for 2920 years. So, nailing down exactly when Shalador was in the Fortress of Ice is seemingly impossible. Point being, between Shalador living there and us visiting the ruin in the Elder Scrolls 1 arena was at least, at least 1200 years and possibly over 3000 years depending on when Shalador was there. So Shalador's Fortress of Ice hung around for a few thousand years, then we got to explore it in the Elder Scrolls 1 arena, but then 235 years after the Elder Scrolls 1 arena, in the Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim, 
when we come to the same location, the ice fields of Winterhold, no such fortress of ice can be found. I find it very strange that this location just seems to have poof vanished in the last 200 years after having remained for thousands of years. In fact, there is only one location that can be found in the ice fields of Winterhold in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. One location that just so happens to perfectly lie exactly where the Fortress of Ice once lay. And that ruin is called Sarthal. Yes, Sarthal, where the Eye of Magnus is found. If we take a look at the map from the Elder Scrolls 1 Arena, we can see that Winterhold is this castle here, and just to the southwest in the ice fields of Winterhold is the Fortress of Ice. And if we have a look at this map from the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, here is Winterhold, and just to the southwest in the ice fields of Winterhold is Sarthal, a location that stands alone, surrounded by no other. Strangely and extremely suspiciously, Sarthal is in exactly the same spot as the Fortress of Ice should be, which has also strangely and extremely suspiciously gone missing in the last 200 years. After staying put, for the last few thousand years. Could it be that this Fortress of Ice and Sarthal are one and the same? The Fortress of Ice is described as a ruin, which Sarthal is and would have been when Shalador was there as Sarthal was functioning during the mythic era before Shalador came to be in the first era. Also, Sarthal is where the Eye of Magnus lies when we first find it. The Eye of Magnus, the god and source of Magicka, sits in a ruin that just so happens to be in the exact same location as the Fortress of Ice, which was a ruin inhabited by Archmage Shalador, who somehow gained an understanding of Magicka that few others have ever achieved. Could it be that he had the Eye of Magnus? He certainly seemed to revere the damn thing. As we've learnt, Shalador created the College of Winterholds. Even his statue stands at the heart of the courtyard to this day. And all around the institution that Shalador founded, we can find Eye of Magnus motifs such as the stained glass windows, the paving patterns on the floor, and of course the gates to enter the College of Winterhold, you literally have to open the Eye of Magnus. <laughs> A foreshadowing, it would seem. There is something else very suspicious. Well, actually it surpasses suspicious and it's almost just so odd and beyond normal evidence to make a point in a video like this that I don't even know what to do with it, but I must tell you about it. Once again, this involves Shalador, Great Power and Winterhold and it gets pretty weird and is comprised of a handful of odd things all mixing together and through each other. So, to the north of the College of Winterholds is an ice hovel called Septimus Cygnus's Outpost. It is quite close to the college. In here we will find a man called Septimus Cygnus, who has spent his life studying and trying to understand the more obscure components of the Elder Scrolls universe, just like the Elder Scrolls themselves. The result is a seemingly mad old wizard, not dangerous, but quite odd and nonchalant in his language and ruminations. Now, along with Septimus Cygnus, inside this ice dwelling is a large Dwemer lockbox. Septimus will give us a quest, at the end of which the Dwemer lockbox will be unlocked. He sought to do this as he believed that the heart of Lorcan was lurking within it, but 
Nay, in here rests a Daedric artifact known as the Ogma Infinium, a relic of the Daedric Prince of Forbidden Knowledge, Hermaeus Mora, also known by many, many other names, including the Demon of Knowledge, the Prince of Fate, the Lord of Secrets, the Golden Eye, Ur Daedra, the Abyssal Cephaliarch, the Old Antecedent, Scryer, the Inevitable Noah, the Woodland Man, and the Gardener of Men among surprisingly many, many more, which I shall not bear down upon you now. So this artifact of his, the Ogma Infinium, has some very special powers, as the knowledge within the tome grants the reader access to the artifact's energy, which can be manipulated to achieve near demigod abilities, powers, and knowledge. We'll get back to this in a second. Now, as we learned earlier, Archmage Shalador existed during the First Era. The only recorded and dated events of his shenanigans are during the early quarter of the era around the 400 year. So I'd imagine that he was active during the first thousand years or so of the First Era. During this time, he wrote a book called Shalador's Insights, which is filled with odd scribblings and diagrams, which appear unreadable. Strangely, there are actually a number of missing pages, which, thanks to the Elder Scrolls community, have been painstakingly deciphered, as they are written in a number of fictional languages and jotted down in harsh fonts. But this one page here bears something very strange indeed. Keep in mind, this was written by Shalador, so it was written literally thousands of years before the events of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Bear that in mind, as it's very important for what you are about to hear. Oh, and while there may be a few mistranslated words here and there, the form of the whole shines through and will bend your brain. So on this page of Shalador's Insights, it says this, and I quote, The current home of Septimus Cygnus answers the question. It's a looming iceberg that happens to have a hutch in it. In the center of the iceberg, though, is a large Dwemer lockbox. Septimus had carved a cave into the iceberg so that one side of the lockbox essentially makes up a wall of the cave. The iceberg was created around the lockbox by some unknown person within the last few hundred years. This person came across the Ogma Infinium, recognized it as an item of evil and sealed it away in the iceberg so that the world would be safe from its influence. It does not need to be a large space, but there should be a space between Septimus's living area and the area which has the lockbox and the exit where one can be out of sight, Hermaeus Mora will appear there." End quote. Hmm, so Shalador's Insights, a book written thousands of years before the events of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, reference very specifically Septimus Cygnus in an iceberg with a Dwemer lockbox that contains the Ogma Infinium and where Hermaeus Mora will appear, all of which are present right here in modern day Skyrim. That's pretty weird, right? Shalador wrote about events that would take place thousands of years in the future. Well, you want to know something even weirder? Inside the Ogma Infinium, Hermaeus Mora's artifact of forbidden knowledge, there is this, a diagram. And if we take this image and then compare it to a bird's eye view of the College of Winterhold, it looks fairly similar to the foundations of the institution, which Shalador founded and built. That is pretty damn odd. Like I said, all of these things are connected and so obscure and strange that I really don't know what to do with this information other than be highly suspicious of all things involving the College of Winterhold and the areas close by. Which brings us back to my point about there being something, a source of power below the College of Winterhold, which as I theorize was the reason Shalador built the college here in the first place. Perhaps Shalador used the Ogma Infinium's knowledge to bolster his arcane understandings, or even build the College of Winterhold. 
After all, the foundations match with a diagram found within the Ogma Infinium. Perhaps this is the power the Augur of Dunlane used to ascend his mortal form. Shalador did seem to have some kind of power of farsight, referencing Septimus Cygnus in his book, an event which would come thousands of years later. This farsight, seeing into the future, is also an ability that the Augur of Dunlane possesses. Perhaps they both got this ability from the same source, the Ogma Infinium. After all, its owner, Hermaeus Mora, among his many other names, is known as the Scryer. A Scryer being someone who can predict the future. Just the same as Shalador and the Augur of Dunlane, both in close proximity to the Ogma Infinium and sharing these scrying powers. Ugh, it's all strange to think about. Ugh, so, and now that we have those pillars set, Let's explore the darkest and deepest theory I have for the Augur of Dunlane causing the Great Collapse. I believe that he intentionally collapsed the majority of the city of Winterhold to cause a mass death, which would provide a payload of souls in order for him to ascend his current form. There are many ways that we can apply this theory to make it make sense within the Elder Scrolls universe, whether it be through a personal ritual, divine sacrifice, daedric payment, or some other infernal method. Often do we see souls being used to power just about everything in the Elder Scrolls. So, destroying half a city to fuel some kind of apotheosis via the Harvested Souls is 100% plausible and quite frankly, probably the most sound theory for the Great Collapse being intentional. Now as we know, leading up to the Great Collapse there were Maelstrom's storms of an unseen ferocity that racked the coastline and supposedly eroded the sea cliffs to a point in which they crumbled away, causing the city of Winterhold to crash into ruin. These storms could have been intentional and cast as a device to cause the Great Collapse via erosion. It would be a clever way to mask it and make it seem like natural disaster. Storm magic is not unheard of within the Elder Scrolls. The Mayama, the Sea Elves of the South, use it all the time. Hell, there is even a class of magic called Weather Magic, which is talked about more in depth in a book called War Weather. If you wish to read about the topic more in depth, check that book out. But back to Weather Magic, even things like the Way of the Voice is a type of magic that can control the weather whether it be calling a storm or clearing the skies. Even the Sigic Order summoned a storm to completely annihilate the Pyandonian fleet, which is ironic as the Pyandonians are the Mayama. They come from the continent of Pyandonia. And the Mayama are the ones who use storm magic most commonly. Funny they should be destroyed by the very same forces. Point being that summoning a storm through magic is something that the Augur of Dunlane could have done in order to cause the Great Collapse. It may have also been the side effect of his ritual, as we do see storm-like weather occurring as the result of another magic, such as the Skull on Solstheim, while meditating their warding ritual against Hermaeus Mora and Mirak, a violent storm-like weather is created around their settlement. Weather magic is also said to be connected to the old ways of magic and is not properly understood in an academic sense in modern day Tamriel. Just like reach magic, which is interesting because in the Elder Scrolls Online, during the Greymoor and Markarth chapter, all of the incredibly destructive Harrow Storms were created by harnessing the power of Reach Witch Magic, the very same magic that the Augur of Dunlane would be very well versed in and would have been raised to use. So in one way or another, the storms that ate the coastline could have very well been intentional or at the very least a result of the Augur and his apotheosis ritual. Now, what exactly would the Augur of Dunlane be doing with all of these souls? 
Well, as I said, we can apply it in many ways, but here is one plausible course of action for you. In Reachman mythology, there is an ancient prophecy and tale of an evil heart below Skyrim, as the Reach which Arana will tell us. A dark heart, you say? There's a tale as old as the Reach with an evil heart at its center. Like most Reach stories, it ends bloody. The story of the Dark Heart. The Ghost Song clan knows it well. My clan. Once. I need to speak with my sister, Nathari. She studied the old secrets. Knows about prophecies both ill and fair. Traditions passed down from our foremothers. Like the story of the prophecy of the Dark Heart. It deals with souls, shadows, endings. Now this Dark Heart is a piece of the Primal Void, from the place between the places outside of Mundus, Oblivion and Aetherius, simply known as the Void. This Dark Heart is said to grant access to eternal life and is considered to be a source of unlimited power. The cost of course is souls, many souls. In the Second Era it was awoken by none other than the Ghost Song Clan, a tribe of Reachmen. And while this clan's sacrifice got the Dark Heart to stir, it was not quite enough to fully awaken it. As Arana clarifies, a mass death is needed. It can be awakened, but I need to get the help of the Reach Witches. To awaken the Dark Heart, my coven must sacrifice that which they hold most dear, their own kin. Many Ghost Song Clan members are about to die. They gladly died to awaken the Dark Heart from its slumber. We give our souls to the Dark in return for eternal life. I shall complete the ritual and awaken the Dark Heart. The prophecy says it takes more than a handful of deaths to awaken the Dark Heart. Something as powerful as the Dark Heart that's been asleep for millennia may stir from the taste of a few souls, but I suspect it needs a banquet to awaken fully. Now, the Dark Heart was last known to dwell in Blackreach, which, as we've learnt, runs all the way from the Reach in the west to Winterhold in the east. And again, as we learn in the Elder Scrolls Online, there are many, many unexplored and unseen caverns and extensions to Blackreach, which are constantly being discovered and revealed. So while we don't know it yet, it could very well run right under the College of Winterhold. As with my earlier theory, I definitely believe there to be a powerful source of something below the College. This Dark Heart could very well be it. Which brings us back to the Augur of Dunlane, his Reachman roots and of course the Great Collapse. The Augur of Dunlane could have very well attempted to awaken the Dark Heart of Skyrim in exchange for great power and eternal life, two things the Dark Heart is said to be able to gift. and two things the Augur of Dunlane seems to have acquired, as he is a far-seeing non-corporeal entity. He would also know of the old stories and prophecies of the Reachman culture, being aware of the tales of the Dark Hearts. So he would be savvy to its existence and of its power while also being aware of what had to be done to harness such power from the Dark Hearts, which as we know, Something is required in exchange. More than a handful of deaths, a massive ritualistic slaughter, a city's worth of people dying at once. Can you think of any events that would fit such a description? Hmm, the Great Collapse, of course. The Great Collapse, which I dare say may have been an intentional sacrifice forced upon the city by the Augur of Dunlane so he could harvest the required payload of soul energy to exchange void energy with the Dark Heart of Skyrim. 
or for some other means. Again, souls being used to make things happen in the Elder Scrolls is commonplace. All the way from something as basic as enchanting an iron dagger, a soul is used for that. Then the other end of the spectrum to things like binding souls to Daedra, to the ideal masters achieving apotheosis, immortality and incorporeality, all traits the Augur of Dunlane has. And they achieved this with nothing other than soul energy. So the Augur of Dunlane intentionally causing the Great Collapse to farm a huge number of souls to empower himself to the purposes of apotheosis, whether it be planned or accidental, is totally feasible. But it doesn't end there. The concept that we explored earlier, that being the Augur of Dunlane casting the warding spell to protect the College of Winterhold from collapsing, still applies here. It just has an ulterior motive. While if it is true, at face value it seems noble, he's, you know, saving the college, with a twist of fate, he was just saving the college for himself. Now why would he do that, you ask? Firstly, he was performing the ritual from within the college. It wouldn't be much use if it collapsed down on him and he died in the process. But more pressingly, as we know, he is the Augur of Dunlane. An Augur. He can see into the future. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what is to come. And what does he know is to come? Well, the events that take place in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. The Eye of Magnus is going to be discovered in Sarthal and brought to the College of Winterhold. The Eye of Magnus, an ethereal relic beyond all magical comprehensions, knowledge and power. The Augur, he saw this, he saw what was to come and wanted it to happen. Because when the Eye of Magnus is brought from Sarthal to the College of Winterhold, where is it placed? Hmm? It is housed right in the magics that flow through the college. The same magics that the Augur of Dunlane is fused with. The Eye of Magnus is literally placed into the Augur of Dunlane, which for someone who strove for power so vehemently, he somehow achieved apotheosis and transcended death and flesh. Well, having an artifact such as the Eye of Magnus resting upon you, in you even, would be an event worth waiting an eternity for. Although, it would seem he didn't have to wait too long at all. Well, not when viewed through the eyes of infinity. You know, 79 years ain't much at all. So the August saved the College of Winterhold, so that in time these events could take place and he could have his fill of the Eye of Magnus. But it goes deeper, as when we speak to the Augur of Dunlane, he reveals that the Thalmor agent, Encarno, came and spoke to him too. The Thalmor sought the same thing, and it shall lead to his end, as it has so many others. Like others before you, you blindly follow a path to your own destruction. The Thalmor came seeking answers as well. Unaware they will be his undoing. Your path now follows his, though you will arrive too late. Thalmor? What Thalmor? The one who calls himself Ancano. He seeks information about the Eye, but what he will find shall be quite different. His path will cross yours in time, but first you must find that which you need. I'm not the first to come see you. No, though you may be the last. The one who calls himself Ancano has sought my knowledge as well, through very different questions. Now while it is not disclosed as to what they spoke about, 
One way or another, Encarno does end up activating the Eye of Magnus to a point where it appears to physically and magically unlock. As we can see with our very own eyes, it has opened up and along with this physical change, magically, all kinds of powerful wizardry and anomalies are spewing out and spawning about the college. And I believe that the Augur of Dunlane gave Ancano the knowledge to set him on course to be able to unlock the Eye of Magnus. Because this is what the Augur wanted. The Augur of Dunlane is the magic that the Eye of Magnus sits in, and what better way to sap as much power from the Eye as Magnus as possible other than to get someone else to unlock the Eye of Magnus for him. The Augur doesn't care for the college, he cares that the college lasted long enough for him to gain access to the Eye of Magnus and the powers within it, which he would know was going to happen because, huge point, he can see into the future. He knows the motions have been set and soon he will have what he wants. So it would seem that the Augur of Dunlane stuck around because he cares about gaining more power, which is exactly what he's been handed as soon as Ancano opens and activates the Eye of Magnus. Now, I also believe that this is what the Sigic Order wanted, or at least some of their members. The Sigic Order members never really see eye to eye and often have conflicting approaches to certain things, such as what to do with the Eye of Magnus. Hell, even in the Elder Scrolls Online, several of their members go rogue and take on paths of their own, often leading to disaster and the quest for us to complete. Regardless, I do believe that the Sigic Order, to some extent, knew that this would happen and they wanted it to happen so that the Augur of Dunlane may absorb power, magic, knowledge, insight, whatever it may be, from an unlocked Eye of Magnus. Seriously, sounds a bit tin foil hatty, but just think about it for a moment. Before we even find the Eye of Magnus in Sarthal, the Sigic Order member Narian stops us and speaks to us. He says the disaster is coming and cannot be stopped. He doesn't say why, he doesn't say why he can't stop it, and even after telling us it can't be stopped, he tells us to try and stop it. Anyway, the Sigic Order uses Augury magic. They even have a pool for farseeing called the Augury. And they have worked with augurs in the past, as with the Augur of the Obscure, which we'll touch on a little later when we discuss what the Augur of Dunlane now is. Anyway, the Sigic Order, in one way or another, or one sense or another, has seen the future. They know roughly what's coming, yet they don't stop it. They don't even try to stop it. They only say that they can't stop it almost as if they don't want to stop it. The Sigic Order has every goddamned chance to come to the College of Winterhold and take the Eye of Magnus back with them to Arteum to completely prevent disaster. Yet they don't. Hell, they could even turn up at Sarthal before we get there and take the Eye of Magnus with them to completely prevent disaster. They don't. Even worse, they wait for the Eye of Magnus to be unlocked by Ancano, which results in many deaths and destruction and destabilization of the magical fields. Then they rock up and take the Eye away. It was so simple, they could have done this at any point. Why would they not do this in the first place? It's like giving a toddler a gun and then waiting until they shoot someone before you take it off them. The Sigic Order have the means to stop disaster. They have the means to tame and take the Eye of Magnus because that's exactly what they do. After, it's too late. They knew what was going to happen. That's why Nerian warns us before we've even found the Eye of Magnus. So why do they not intervene? Why do they allow this to happen? Because they want it to happen. 
they want the Augur of Dunlane to be granted access to this artifact and its power. At least, that is the most feasible way to make their seemingly nonsensical approach to the whole Eye of Magnus ordeal make any actual sense. Also, curiously, when we speak to the Augur of Dunlane, he says this. I'm not the first to come see you. No, though you may be the last. Now, why would we be the last to come and see him? What's going to happen that would result in people not coming to see him anymore? It stinks of the knowledge that he is going to soon get what he wants, and then he will leave. Again, if this theory is true, the only reason he stuck around is him knowing what was coming. The Eye of Magnus. Interestingly, the first time we hear about the Augur of Dunlane is also from the mouth of a Sigic Order monk. I fear I have already overstepped the bounds of my order, but I will offer this. Seek out the Augur of Dunlane here in your college. His perception may be more coherent than ours. He was once a student here at the college. Now he is... something different. And the Sigic Order, as I mentioned, has worked with mm, entities in the past that also bear the title of Augur. Specifically, the Augur of the Obscure, another strange, all-knowing being who takes the shape, or is the shape, of a blue crystalline skull. With this in mind, it would make sense that the Sigic Order would want to work with the Augur of Dunlane, as they've employed another Augur previously, the Augur of the Obscure. Before you get confused, as I mentioned towards the start of the video, at the time of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's release, the only other mention of an Augur was in the Reachman culture, in the book The Legend of Red Eagle. But then, in the Elder Scrolls Online, many years later, the Augur of the Obscure was introduced, who is most certainly not a Reachman. Instead, he, or it even, is something that at this point in time I cannot define. But, again, plays the same role, seeing the future, knows all and is highly, highly valued by the Sigic Order in the Second Era. So the concept that the Sigic Order would not only want to work with, but would empower the Augur of Dunlane makes complete sense. Interestingly, during the events of the Elder Scrolls Online, we learn that a Witch of High Rock, a Weiress known as the Oracle, Mariv, can communicate with the Sigic Order through her use of old magic, the same ancient realm of magic Reach Magic comes from. The Sigic Order is a monastic society that follows the old ways of magic. I belonged to the Order myself back in the day before a disagreement over another member led me to break ranks and form the Mages' Guild. We no longer see eye to eye. Mariv not only sees into the hidden places, she has a way to contact them. It allows her to communicate with the Sigic Order's Rite Master. I assume that's one way the Order keeps track of affairs on Nern from wherever it is they hid their island. So if locating and communicating with the Zijic Order monks is possible for a witch to do using old magic, then this same access would surely be easily within the Augur of Dunlane's array of abilities, which would also explain how the Zijic Order knew of him in the first place. Again, the first time we hear about the Augur of Dunlane is from the Zijic monks, but beyond this, they could have also been working together and plotting, if you want to call it that, for many years, hatching their plan to unlock the Eye of Magnus so the Augur can absorb its power, before taking his leave from Winterhold to Arteum to work with the Sigic Order. Of course, all of these musings could be untrue and my theory could be wrong, but the College of Winterhold's questline reeks of a stunted and possibly unfinished, tacked together experience for the player. And what I have presented is my best efforts to make any sense of it, from the assuming perspective of the questline was all planned and thought out. After all, what is in the games is canon, so it's what we have to work with. And what I've explained and pieced together is again my best efforts to make a deep 
and plausible explanation out of the weird, jumbled, and quite frankly, limited information that we get in-game. In regards to the Augur of Dunlane, the Great Collapse, the Eye of Magnus, the Sigic Order, and everything to do with the College of Winterhold's questline. So of course, everything I've said could be completely false, but if you can come up with a better, more plausible theory that makes all of the, uh, scrambled questline make any sense, Please tell me what it is. So now that we have deeply delved into what happened to the Augur of Dunlane, some kind of apotheosis, and explored the possible methods in which this took place and why, let's talk about, or more ponder, what the Augur of Dunlane now is. What is his state of existence? Well. The Augur of Dunlane appears to be an omnipresent, non-corporeal entity that can appear, if he so wishes, as a giant orb of light. It's not known if he is limited to this shape, or if this is just the shape he chooses to take. It's important to note that he is not a ghost. As we can see in the creation kit, he is not tagged as a ghost. and. More interestingly, if we use a Detect Life spell or the Detect Dead spell, neither will register with the Augur of Dunlane. So he seems to be something else, some kind of undefinable entity, or more, his state is undefinable. He is not alive, nor is he dead, he simply exists. The closest example of something like this that I can think of, that being a mortal becoming a non-corporeal entity that is neither alive nor dead, and therefore some kind of limbo immortal, would be the ideal masters. The rulers of the plane of oblivion known as the Soul Can. I do have a lore video exploring everything we know about the Ideal Masters and also have a full 2 hour plus curating curious curiosities video for the Plane of Oblivion, the Soul Can, which is ruled by the Ideal Masters, both of which I would highly recommend you check out. But for now, back to the Ideal Masters and their parallels with the Augur of Dunlane. In the Elder Scrolls Online, we can enter a pocket realm of oblivion called the Maelstrom Arena, lauded by the Demi-Prince Farnuet Hen, who, when questioned about pocket realms, explains in detail how they come to be. But more importantly, he reveals some information on immortals, which could very well be what we're dealing with here. Anyway, the words of the Demi Prince himself, and I quote, So far as I know, pocket realms can be created and maintained by mortals such as the Great Daedra, though, of course, it's well known that mortals have the capacity to ascend to immortality. Such ascended mortals often become great pests as far as we Daedra are concerned, so I don't think I'll go into the means of such ascension. Who wants more pests, eh? But I will give you an example. The ideal masters who ruled the Soul Can pocket realm were once mortals like yourself. If you get the chance to visit that frankly, rather unattractive little reality, perhaps the ideal masters will tell you how they worked it. I wouldn't count on it though, they're notoriously short on empathy, and at the first excuse will confine you inside a tight little crystal for all eternity, <laughs> whatever that means. Long ago, as you reckon such things, the ideal masters were an early order of sorcerers who practiced necromancy, trafficking in souls great, small, and fragmentary. They became very powerful, and eventually found their physical forms to be unacceptably weak and limiting, by means which I shall not articulate, they transcended those forms and became beings of soul energy. They entered oblivion as immortals, selected an area of chaotic creation, and crafted it into a pocket realm ideal for their purposes as soul merchants. They dubbed this pocket the Soul Can and, pleased with themselves, they adopted the name Ideal Masters as a title. And I end quote. So, while the Demi Prince, Van Nuet Hen, sadly doesn't go into detail, 
He does explain that mortals such as ourselves, such as the Augur of Dunlane in his human life, can ascend to a state of immortality. And the given example, the ideal masters, are non-corporeal beings, much like the Augur of Dunlane, who exists in a state that isn't alive, nor is it dead. It's something else, a different, higher state of existence. Now, this is not to say that I think the Augur of Dunlane is an ideal master, but more, this could very well be in the same ballpark as what happened to the Augur of Dunlane or more the ballpark of what the Augur of Dunlane has become. Whether it was unintentional or intentional, the Augur does seem to now be an immortal, non-corporeal being. I'd like to quickly clarify that within the Elder Scrolls universe, immortality is a strange subject. In that entities that would be considered immortal have died, and can die. Also, immortality isn't necessarily permanent and can wear off. For example, vampirism is considered a form of immortality. Despite it only making one immune to aging and disease, vampires can still be killed by just about every other conventional way of dying. And vampirism can also be cured and removed from the infected. So as you'll begin to understand, immortality is a loose term, but there is a clear difference between a vampire, an ideal master, and a divine, despite them all falling under the loose umbrella term of immortal. With that said, the Augur of Dunlane appears to be in a very unique position or class of his own, and I wouldn't take his current state lightly or for granted, i.e. he's got some serious power and isn't going to be killed by any silver blades or sunlight. I don't know how many tiers of immortality there are, but he'd be up there with the ideal masters. Now, some examples of the flexibility of the term immortality can be found in the law book fittingly titled On Immortality. And I quote, among nobles of the first era, drinking the honey of the Isgareth bee of Oridon was said to grant limited immortality, though one needed to continue to eat the honey in order to maintain the effect. Some say this led directly to the Isgareth bee's extinction, as indiscriminate men destroyed whole hives in order to more quickly harvest the precious golden substance and sell it at a high price to the foolish and fashionable. Though it is said that Altmeri kings and queens maintain a private hive. So as we can see, immortality within the Elder Scrolls universe is a strange concept and can be quite ephemeral, from which we can coin such phrases as, oh, he was immortal until he died. It's a funny thought, but the word immortality generally gets the idea across. Now there is something else within this book, but First, let me show you something else curious that will be a good lead up to it. Now, in the mid and dark, the underhalls of the College of Winterhold, the same place where we find the Augur of Dunlane and all of his strange Reachman fetishes and totems, we can enter a curious circular room. Around it, there are the blasted remains of four college students, the ones we spoke about earlier. Bloodied bones strewn about the place like chicken feed to a pecking patch. At the center of the room is a cursed shrine, atop which sits an outstretched Daedric gauntlet, with the Daedric rune Ot blazon on the palm. The remains of a grim ritual, no doubt. Well, inside the Arcanium at the College of Winterhold, there is in fact an evidence chest with a master lock. If we pry it open inside, we will find four rings. Katarina's ring, Treoi's ring, Balwin's ring, and Pithikin's ring. If we take these rings back down to the gauntlet, we can place them into a certain order onto the fingers of the Daedric gauntlet, that order being Katarina's ring on the index finger, Treoi's ring on the middle finger, 
Balwin's ring on the ring finger, and finally Pithikin's ring on the little finger. This will reveal the truth. A Dramora, who serves as one of Molog Bal's generals, also known as the Pirate King of the Abyssian, Velexane, was bound to the gauntlets by the four students who appear to have died in this ritual. If you do want his full story, I do have a full video on Velexane for you. But the reason I bring him up is this rather curious verse in the book that we were reading a few minutes ago titled On Immortality, and I quote, Another means of achieving immortality is said to exist, but it has only been attempted by the most volatile and unstable. It's also forbidden by governments across Tamriel and by the Mages Guild. It's said to involve the binding of a Daedra through blood sacrifice. Hmm, so an immortal, non-corporeal being who dwells and did dwell in the mid and dark, the Augur of Dunlane, is found in the same place as a ritual that involved the binding of a Daedra, the like sane and seemingly blood sacrifices, as with the four college students who now lie scattered around the gauntlet like fallen petals from a wedding bell tower steeple. Now, whether this was the doing of the Augur of Dunlane or not is up to one's own instincts, but the fact it's found within his lair, the mid and dark, is very strange and makes one naturally suspicious of the whole scene. So given that we don't really know what happened to the Augur of Dunlane or what his apotheosis involved, and the huge lack of information about the Augur in game, it seems impossible to hammer down exactly what he is now. We know that he's not alive nor dead. He can see into the future. He is a non-corporeal entity and seemingly immortal. Well, there aren't really any categories that he falls into, except for, once again, everyone's favorite, the Ideal Masters. They seem to tick all the same boxes as the Augur. And while I don't think the Augur is one, their journey beyond the flesh seems to have landed them in just about the same state. Although, as far as I'm aware, the Ideal Masters cannot farsi, so this is a power that the Augur of Dunlane holds over them. Now, as I have brought up a few times, there is another Augur in the Elder Scrolls Online, the Augur of the Obscure. I'm guessing he is male, as he has a male voice, although where he comes from, gender may not exist. I don't believe that the Augur of Dunlane and the Augur of the Obscure are related at all, as the Augur of the Obscure is a blue crystal skull who seems to know everything about Elder Scrolls lore. He is also known to lie constantly, but even if he is lying, he still brings up subjects that most other NPCs wouldn't even be aware of. It's like he's some kind of mouthpiece for an actual real life lore master just put within the game. The lore master didn't tell you? All right, oh, how to explain it? The auger is a skull, sort of. It's really a crystalline entity that resembles a skull. Some think it's from the head of an ancient mage, but I don't believe that for a minute. I'm what you might call an aspect, eh? Like an idea's shadow. Don't make a face, I'm telling you the truth. Not my fault your language is so crude. I'm not in the skull, I am the skull. At least here on Nern. Over in the adjacent place, I'm shaped like a throw pillow. Imagine that. You look confused, it, it's just a trick of the light, mate. The skull's what you might call a manifestation. Everything has a name. Names give a thing its shape. Birds, snowflakes, tea kittles, you get the idea. I tell you mine, but you'd need about six more tongues and a pair of symbols to pronounce it correctly, so let's not bother. One of the unfortunate quirks of the Sigic binding ritual that brought me here. I'm free to lie as much as I like, unless you, or anyone else for that matter, ask me a direct question. Cheap trick if you ask me. 
I don't blame them, honestly. If I was in their position, bobbing along like a little lost acorn in an ocean of knowledge, I'd want to trap me too. Yes, in answer to your direct question, I do know a lot, and by a lot, I mean basically everything. Watch your step around here, mate. This arena is what we in the dimension hopping community call a really bad idea door. Daedric mistrip for sure. You know I can see time in all directions. I see you as you are now, as you were before you were born, and as you'll be after you're dead all at once. You're an adorable baby, mate. Less charming as a corpse. He also says that he's originally from a parallel place, which could be in reference to Lig, a kind of negative Rorschach imprint of Mundus into the universe, the same place the Dreg came from originally. But this is all got to be in a video for another day, because as interesting as the Augur of the Obscure is, he is entirely unrelated to the Augur of Dunlane and has no relevance in this video beyond explaining why another being with the title Augur has no relevance being in this video. Important to note that the Augur of the Obscure is the Augur that the Sijic Order worked closely with in the Second Era, which is why I think that now in the Fourth Era, the Sijic Order would want to work with the Augur of Dunlane because he can provide the same powers, Augury. Ah uh, yes, now there are several more astral concepts that I'm sure are buzzing about some of your heads in regards to the Augur of Dunlane's Ascendants, and they would be the Six Walking Ways. Most famously among them is Chim, or Kim, or Kaim, depending on how you want to pronounce it. But I did ask an actual Elder Scrolls lore master who works for Bethesda, and he said Chim is the canon way to pronounce Chim, with a ch like cheese, his words. But anyway, before we open this cosmic door, I'd like to highlight that the six walking ways are primarily discussed within the 36 lessons of Vivek, which if you've ever read them, are written in such a strange way that their content is basically entirely up to the poetic license of the reader. So the rules and workings of the six walking ways aren't clearly stated, so anything I do say could very well be interpreted by someone else in a completely different manner and meaning, despite us both reading the same in-game text. So don't take my explanations as canon, merely my best understanding of the obscure and abstract in-game texts, the 36 lessons of Vivek. Now some of these concepts are also elaborated on by unofficial texts, the workings of Michael Kirkbride. The same guy that came up with the ideas in the first place, then left Bethesda Game Studios, but then went on to explain them further while no longer working for the company. So while it is unofficial, these concepts have been explained further by the very same man that invented them in the first place. So there's a lot of salt to be taken with everything we're about to talk about. I mean, even the order of the six walking ways, like which methods fall under which number isn't truly known either. So my explanations may not be canon, my list order may not be canon, just my best efforts to interpret what we have. With that said, let's take a look. Firstly, the Prolix Towers, the devices built by the Mur, the Elves, to mimic the gods. The use of the Towers of Nern, the Merethically built ones, to achieve godhood. As far as I know, there are no examples of this. And while we're on the topic of towers, there was a recent theory that the Augur of Dunlane became a stone to a new tower, the Tower of Magnus, the tower itself being the College of Winterhold. But the more I looked into this theory, the more it was evident that there was in fact no evidence at all behind the theory. Only a cool idea, so please brush that away from your minds. Secondly, the Sijic Endeavor, the path of the Prophet of Veloth. Despite the name Sijic, the Sijic Endeavor isn't related to the Sijic Order at all. It is said to be a method to ascend mortal boundaries to reach a state of existence known as Chim, which funnily is its own walking way as well. Again, I don't have any in-game examples of this unless you want to interpret stuff very differently than I have. Thirdly, the Numidium, the Dwemer's anti-creation, using the machine god to achieve one's own godhood. 
possibly what Madame Marco did during the events of the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. The Mantella is hurled from Ethereus, and although drawn to the empty chest of Great Numidium, the will of the King of Worms commands its to his side. With its power, the King of Worms leaves his mortal frame and joins the ranks of the gods of Oblivion. Fourthly, the Enantiomorph, also known as Mantling. This is where one walks like them until they walk like you reenacting a god's history so thoroughly that you become that god. An example of this is the player character in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion's DLC, The Shivering Isles, where the player character, the champion of Cyrodiil, becomes Sheogorath. They mantle Sheogorath. It's not replacing Sheogorath, it's literally becoming Sheogorath. You aren't now you in Sheogorath's position, you are just now literally Sheogorath. One of my earlier theories was that the Augur of Dunlane mantled the magics of the College of Winterhold, but it would appear mantling can only be done to a god, whether that be Daedra or Aedra, and also you have to become that, whereas the Augur of Dunlane isn't just a pool of magic, he is a conscious being separate to the magics, even though he's fused with the magics. Fifthly though, is Chim, the path of Vivek, attainable only through pure love of everything, understanding that the Elder Scrolls universe is a dream, kind of like lucid dreaming, being aware it's a dream, and being able to move freely and act freely like a god within this dream. And sixthly, the scarab that transforms into the new man. This is someone who becomes something called the Amaranth, who replaces the Godhead. Now the Godhead is the dreamer. The Elder Scrolls universe is the Godhead's dream. However, unlike us and our dreams, the dream does not exist without the dreamer. But in the Elder Scrolls, the dreamer does not exist without the dream either, and this whole dream is being had by the dreamer, and that dreamer is something called the Godhead. So the scarab that transforms into the new man is someone who becomes the Amaranth, and the Amaranth is someone who becomes the Godhead, the dreamer. Now, the six walking ways are quite vague and sickeningly astral, and I do not believe are related to the Augur of Dunlane, as they all appear to involve an ascendance to divinity, whereas we have no reason at all to believe the Augur of Dunlane is in fact a god, simply a higher being when compared to your average mortal. Although, there is this fact. When we speak to the Augur of Dunlane, we cannot leave conversation with him. Our character is locked into conversation and none of his dialogue can be skipped. This, mechanically, within the game, is only seen in Skyrim when talking to Daedric Princes. And I would imagine it would be the same with Divines if they were to talk to us in-game at any point, but they don't. But do you not see that this is very strange, that the Augur of Dunlane has been gifted this unskippable dialogue by a developer, when again, it's only used for Daedric Princes? Does this mean he is considered so worthy that the player character literally can't ignore his speech? Maybe this mechanic is intentionally placed to fit into the lore and is a testament to the being's power, as in that they are so powerful within the game that they hold your character's attention whether you like it or not. They force you to focus on them while they talk. It's a detail easily missed, but does have huge implications, and may be in reference and a slight little clue to the Augur's true power. I will say this, however, and again, I don't quite know what to do with this information other than bolster our already heavy suspicion that something really weird is going on around the College of Winterhold. So, in the Elder Scrolls Legends, Bethesda's recently defunct Elder Scrolls-based strategy card game in the Heroes of Skyrim expansion, a card called the College of Winterhold was introduced seems just fine, but when you play the card, something very strange is said. Hypertalk, Hardcore, Shima, Altadun. 
Now it's hard to make out, so I'll play the extracted audio file again. I got talk, pad home, shima altadun. And again. I got talk, pad home, shima altadun. I got talk, pad home, shima altadun. A direct translation of that, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But it does mention Chim, and the verse as a whole is a direct excerpt from the 15th sermon of the 36 Lessons of Vivek, texts which, as we spoke of a few minutes ago, primarily discuss the six walking ways among other things. It is also said in a voice that seems beyond mortal capabilities, and is edited in a way that seems to be reserved for ascended entities. I got talk, pardon, shima altadun. So of all cards in the entire game of the Elder Scrolls Legends, the College of Winterhold card says, I got talk, pardon, shima altadun. In an unearthly voice for no apparent reason, coming directly from a text that references the ways needed to ascend to godhood. That is very, very strange. I mean, there are so many other cards that could say this line. Vivek, Almalexia, Sothasil, Dagothur, you know, characters that actually have relation to the 36 lessons of Vivek. But out of everything, the College of Winterhold quotes the 15th sermon of the 36 lessons of Vivek about Chim, and spoken in Elnafex, an ancient language entirely unrelated to the College of Winterhold. It is all making me look over my shoulder with great unease as to some very odd and astral goings-ons. However, together we can attempt to translate this phrase. Hey God took a bad home chim I alta dun. Ah, but sadly it is as interpretable as the book that it comes from. The problem with Elnafex, particularly when it is in all capital letters, is that it is more a language of symbolism and association, rather than just having a 100% definable meaning. The same way a piece of art is subjective to the viewer's interpretation, so is all caps Elnafex. But each stroke, each word, has a meaning. Or meanings are means is or I am, but more specifically the state of being. So is or I am as in what something's state is. Gatuk means hands, specifically though hands as weapons, not just any old hands. Padhorm is another name for Padme, one of the two original deities, the other being Anu. Padme represents chaos and change, the opposite of stasis in the divine sense. Chim, as a word, means royalty, starlight, high splendor, representing the concept that God is love. And Alta Dun means weapon. So a direct translation is something along the lines of I am or is hands as weapons, chaos change, royalty, starlight, splendor, is or I am weapon. So as you can see, a direct translation is not really possible, but the words and meanings themselves can be molded into a number of bigger pictures. You know, Chim is Padme's weapon in my hands to bring a state of splendor, or in my hands is Padme, chaos, which is royalty, which is my weapon. I am a state of splendor and starlight. Chim is my weapon in my hands, and I will bring chaos. You know, there's a million ways to kind of string these phrases together to assemble some kind of digestible piece of language, but overall, you know, the phrase is a bit too astral for my taste. But does it have any relation to the Augur of Dunlane? I'll let you decide that. It is sickeningly out of place for the College of Winterhold, an institution in Skyrim founded by a Nord, to be found quoting the 36 lessons of Evec talking about Chim and Padme and hands as weapons in Eln effects, speaking in an unearthly voice. I got talk, pardon, shima altadun. 
What does that mean? It means our already huge pile of oddities and strangenesses that have littered our journey through the deeper veracities of the College of Winterhold and of course their subterranean overlord, the Augur of Dunlane, just got a little bigger. So what do we know? The Augur of Dunlane, a once mortal Breton likely son of a Hagraven, came to the College of Winterhold and underwent some form of apotheosis, ascending to this being we find here in Skyrim, likely through the means of absorbing the souls of Winterhold after intentionally causing the Great Collapse and lying in wait after plotting with the Sigic Order to absorb power from the Eye of Magnus to some unknown and unspecified means. It's all so dizzying, but I sure do hope that we see the Augur of Dunlane in a future Elder Scrolls game. For now though, I do hope that you have enjoyed the journey and my best efforts to piece together and make sense of the convoluted College of Winterhold questline, and of course, the most elusive and mysterious character involved in it all, the Augur of Dunlane. I am so genuinely very interested to hear your thoughts on the Augur of Dunlane and all of the obscure facets that we dug through in our quest. Was the Augur of Dunlane a Reachman? Is the Augur a Hagraven Prince? Does he hold the powers of his mother, a Hagraven? Did he intentionally cause the Great Collapse? Did he use the souls to awaken the Dark Heart of Skyrim? What is his odd connection to Shalador and the College? Did he equip Ankana with the knowledge to unlock the Eye of Magnus? Did he work with the Sigic Order to absorb power from the Eye? What has the Augur of Dunlane become? Did he achieve one of the six walking ways? Ah, such questions are all in a day's work, well three months work, when it comes to investigating the Elder Scrolls series and its many, many strange stories. So I do hope that you have learnt something new about the beautifully mad universe that these wonderful games take place in, the Elder Scrolls. If you have any information, facts, evidence, speculation, theories, or anything in regards to what we investigated, be sure to comment down below. Below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. If you do have any ideas for something that should be covered in an Elder Scrolls Detective series video, be sure to let me know. I'll look into whatever strange and wonderful topics you present. If you did enjoy this video, please do me a kindness and leave a like, leave a comment with your Elder Scrolls Detective video ideas and your thoughts on our astral friend, the Augur of Dunlane. And of course, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos similar to this one, please subscribe. It helps me know that people enjoy this kind of content and will result in more of it in the long run. Be sure to click the little bell icon next to the subscribe button right here on YouTube so that you are notified when new Elder Scrolls Detective videos are uploaded. My other Elder Scrolls Detective videos can be found down via the playlist link in the description and down there you can also find all of my social media links. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter along with joining our brand new Discord server. I look forward to seeing you there and discussing theories surrounding this video, its content and your conclusions. Now, if you would like to support my channel in a more personal way, you can become a patron on Patreon or support the channel right here on YouTube with that join button. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is genuinely most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So leave a like, leave a comment and subscribe if you want to. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for supporting my channel. I've been Cowell and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.